This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Hello, one and all, to episode 14 of Through the Years, the show where two intrepid travelers review Ring of Honor show by show from the beginning. As always, I am Trevor Dame, and as occasionally, it's Matt Feuerstein. He's always with me, but he's occasionally Matt Feuerstein. Yes, I am also occasionally, I don't know, you didn't tell me this joke was coming, so I didn't have time to think of any funny <laughs> pseudonyms or alter egos. Um, have you traveled anywhere intrepidly lately? Uh, no, I uh, intrepidly traveled earlier today to get some Pepto-Bismol oh. for some food poisoning. Other than that, oh. uh, my travels have been pretty uh, short. Well, you're a trooper. Yes. With uh, doing this show with food poisoning. How are you feeling? Uh, pretty good now, actually. Uh, I Yes, I try so hard. Just for you people listening, you should know the great links. I spent upwards of $4.35 so I can have relief in time to do this podcast. That's Canadian dollars, everybody. Yeah, so that's like two cents American. What did you eat? Uh, the sad tragedy is I found a really good Chinese food place, and I think it's like Actually, the worst Chinese food place that just happens to taste good uh, is my new suspicion, but... Maybe you just like the taste of rotten food. <laughs> hey, things are looking up. My budget's going to go way down there. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, um, something that isn't rotten, though, is the wonderful shows at the Place to Be Nation, Pro Wrestling Only Podcast Network. Every episode, I try and recommend a specific episode of a good show... And this week, I or this episode, it's not a weekly show, is I'm going to plug Mount Olympus, the fall 2017 episode. And that's a special limited podcast done by Kelly from various podcasts on the network and Richard Land, where they're reviewing uh, the WWE unreleased DVD set, where it was a bunch of new WWE, like, never-before-seen matches from the vault. And I feel like When I was just looking at the Pro Wrestling Only site, or Place to Be Nation site the other day, like, their podcast reminded me of the existence of that set. So, I think it's actually, like, a really interesting topic that not enough people are talking about. It's just getting lost in the glut of how much wrestling we have these days. So, and I think a lot of the stuff, I haven't listened to the whole episode yet, but they're getting into, like, the new generation era. So, people, if you're like me, who kind of grew up in the early to mid 90s where that's where you really caught on with your wwf fandom i think it's going to be a a real fun look back at that but yeah and i um for a second i thought you said it was going to be hosted by kelly and richard lewis and i was just (laughs) trying to imagine richard lewis talking about what he tells his shrink about his memories of 90s wwf oh i would love to see uh Richard Lewis just do a whole podcast about the undertaker you know the prince of darkness talking about another prince of darkness just that's right. Good he time. stole his his whole black getup from Richard Lewis. <laughs> Little known fact about the Undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So, and before I get to the news, we have one thing, uh, an a grievous error I made on the last episode. I have to rectify, which is I forgot to bring up. Yes. On the last episode, there was man-on-woman violence. I wanted to keep that up to date that as of the last episode, that streak is 13 for 13. I think Allison Danger got hit accidentally or on purpose or pulled into the way during the main event of Revenge on the Prophecy. And let's just say, spoilers, the streak will go 14 for 14 with this episode of man-on-woman violence. As if if anybody... uh... As if anybody was unsure of that fact. Like, I I just want to know one day, like, I can't wait for the episode where we get the Trivial Pursuit answer of, what's the first Ring of Honor show where a woman doesn't get hit by a man somehow? Yeah, we're going to get to it at some point, and I hope that we we notice. (laughs) It's Gabe's final show. He's just like, oh, I give up. Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot of um, still things being held over from ECW at this point, which I guess we can get to as we... Go on with the show. <laughs> and um, one other, th- one other that actually takes me right into a nice bit of news where, well, we have this continuing um, arc with the man-on-woman violence counter that's going to continue. There's a couple things that are going to come to an end on this episode, and one of them is, long-time listeners of Through the Years would know, 
that we've done a lot of Observer little comments about, oh, Ring of Honor is debating about losing their TV. Oh, they've changed their mind. They think it is helping. They're going to keep it. Oh, they're going to get rid of their Philly TV deal. Well, sadly, this is the end of the era because going to the Observer from this time, I will read... Ring of Honor gave up its television, which it has been considering considering literally from the day it got television, making the announcement on the January 14th show. The time spent to produce weekly television caused delays in getting the videotapes and DVDs of their shows out, and the entire Ring of Honor business model is designed on such sales. For Ring of Honor, if they draw sellouts but don't get tape sales, the show isn't a success. If they draw at all, if they don't draw at all, but get tape sales, it is a success. Their feeling is that they have to get the tapes out within a month, or whatever good reviews they get from the shows are forgotten. Because of producing TV, the videotapes are coming out 8 to 12 weeks after the shows, and DVDs are taking even longer, which is why their VH- VHS sales are a, he- a-, a way ahead Dave writes, a way ahead, no, it's way ahead of DVDs, which goes against all laws of modern wrestling. Booker Gabe Sapolsky said that TV wasn't helping business at all, as they were drawing the same before TV as after, and they were all and they were getting no videotape business from the TV show, which also was the idea for having TV was largely to push the videos. So at this point in the story, I'm like, oh well, sad, it's the end of an era. But I'm like, it's finally done. And then I read this next last sentence, and Matt, it's like the scene in the horror movie where you think you've killed the villain, and then he rises up to try and attack you one more time, because Dave ends the article writing, still, they are talking about getting back on TV in the spring when they get more editing equipment and feel that producing the TV show won't delay getting the tapes out. So, But if there's no benefit to it, then why are they doing it? Just because yeah. they think it's cool? It's like a good thing to say that they have? Yeah, I don't know if it's just, yeah, like, I think that might probably be the most likely thing. It's just that badge of, oh, we have TV. Because, again, I remember at this time they were saying a bunch of other indie promotions had Philly TV on the same channel on different nights in that time slot. So maybe it would just be like a kid me up with the Joneses or since they, it would be CZW, like kid me up with the Zandigs. Can somebody um, clue me in on what editing equipment they were using in 2003 that they need more of the equipment and not say more editors to make it go faster. <laughs> Quite frankly, um, I don't know if, yeah, if they're, what they're giving here is an excuse to Dave because I was reading recently some torch talks with Gabe and there was one from like 2003 or early 2004. No, I think early 2004 where Gabe was going like the, the person doing the interview, I forget if it was Wade or Jason Powell was like, the tapes are still coming out late. And Gabe was like, yeah, that's because we've been running more shows. But now, instead of just Doug Gentry editing, editing the shows, we've got another couple people helping him. So hopefully they'll be coming out quicker. But like this was a problem for a while. And they had multiple reasons. Like here, the scapegoat as well. It takes time to edit these shows. And then later it changes to, well, we're doing more shows. But I guess that interview tells you that for a long time, like at least for the first year or two, Doug Gentry was doing all the editing work. Yeah, it. Uh, it seems like he was doing a lot of a lot of things for a while. Yeah, and actually, I'll just skip ahead. Um, this was special because this show was Ring of Honor. The show we're going to be covering today, which is Ring of Honor's one year anniversary show, was Ring of Honor's you know biggest show up to that point in a many ways. But one of the biggest way, one of the ways it was bigger was it was their first ever double tape set and Ring of Honor charged 29.95 for a 4 hour 7 minute show on two tapes. It's the first time they ever did a two tape show and I went to on the Wayback Machine to Ring of Honor's website and it was interesting. They said it was such a big deal the show was so big to them and they wanted to get it out quickly. I'll read from their website back then. All other tape and DVD production will be stopped so that the anniversary event can go into immediate production for a release in about three weeks. So is so, that saying that this show actually came out before Revenge on the Prophecy? Um, I'm not sure. I wouldn't be surprised. But it's interesting, again, that you know Ring of Honor is owned at this point and run by RF Video. And they're basically at such a point where the best they can do to get a show out rush is if they stop doing everything else they're doing in video production, and that's still three weeks turnaround. Not, not surprising though, when you think about it, like that that they needed because you can't imagine they had too many people on staff. 
Yeah, exactly. And again, I think it's probably just just like Gabe was wearing eight hats. Uh, I think Doug Gentry was probably doing a ton of the production stuff. So it's just it's interesting that RF video wasn't quite prepared for actually producing a wrestling promotion. And it's it's interesting, I guess, in the sense that um, I feel like people's tolerance today for waiting times on wrestling is a lot shorter than back then. So it's interesting that even then they still had that concern. But like nowadays I listen to, for example, the voices of wrestling podcast and they'll talk about how like they, they rarely watch PWG, even though it gets great hype and they know they'll probably enjoy the shows because they feel like it's old news by the time that comes out on, on DVD or stuff. But I mean, Ring of Honor was like that. It's entire hot time was, you know, you would hear the reports and you knew you were going to have to wait weeks to see that show. And then you'd get that second level of buzz where everyone that got the tape would talk about it again. But yeah, it's just, I feel like now there's, it would be even less tolerated than it was back then because Back then, I think you just accepted it. Nowadays, I think there's a lot of people that are like, if I can't see a wrestling show either live or within days after it happened, I'm not interested in watching it. Yeah, I, you know, I sort of feel that way at this point. It, it definitely feels weird to me. Like, I don't get PWG DVDs, even though I think I'd probably like them, because it does feel like, you know, just the, not even just like the time but the, and the turnaround, but just also the whole process of spending lots of money on multiple DVDs seems crazy you know, with, you know, modern technology. So it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, I think about, you know, the process of getting the ROH shows back then, you know, even a couple of years after this, when I was really into them and they would have the, you know, the buy three, get one free sales. That's pretty much what I did all the time. And I don't know, it seems really crazy to even, and I have, and I have more money now that, you know, big brag that I'm doing more money now than I did (laughs) when I was, um, you know, when I was in my early twenties, but, I, I, it seems crazy to spend that kind of money on stuff now. Yeah, there's just it, – it's weird. Like I feel – in a way, it makes me feel kind of selfish that there's that mindset now. But it's funny that – like for some reason, I just – before I read this news story, I just thought, well, nowadays people are impatient. But back then, we were all super patient. But then you read Dave writing that you know the VHS sales do better than the DVD sales because the DVDs come out later and that they're rushing production of this – Probably just because they feel like if they don't capitalize on the buzz within the first month, like, that's going to drastically hurt their bottom line. The VHS is coming out faster was a thing all the way through like 2006. I remember buying uh, VHS as early as early 06 because I just didn't want to wait for the DVDs to come out like three weeks after that. And that's something that's continued to this day with uh, Gabe's projects. I know, like, the Blu-rays, not that Blu-ray wrestling is a huge market now, but I know, like, the Blu-rays for Evolve shows were way behind, like, what you would hope. Like, it would be a big deal, like, okay, we got Blu-rays now for the show that happened nine months ago. Like, get it while it's lukewarm. (laughs) Yeah. But um, going to the next story, though, this is more of a call for anyone. I, I did not deep research into this, so I'm probably just missed it, but or it might not be out there. But I thought this was interesting. I vaguely remembered it. Between the last show and this show, the Travel Channel, it, they announced, is doing a documentary on pro wrestling called Tricks of the Trade, which airs at 10 p.m. Eastern on February 10th. They will air a lot of footage from the 727 Ring of Honor show, which was crowning a champion, and Dave says, which was a hell of a show. So... If anyone has any access online to a documentary called Tricks of the Trade on the Travel Channel that apparently had a lot of footage from Ring of Honor, I'd kind of be interested in seeing – because that's probably Ring of Honor's first ever somewhat mainstream exposure. I don't think the Travel Channel in 2003 is necessarily that much exposure, but – I feel like I've seen some of it, but I can't remember exactly – yeah, I vaguely recall, but I'd be interested in, if anyone has a link to it. We'll have contact info at the end of the show, but if anyone has any links to it or has found it somewhere on YouTube or RuTube or something insidious like that, I'll take a look at it. <laughs> and Anything that has Ru in it, scary stuff. <laughs> uh, RuPaul's pretty unscary. Oh, that's he true. Nice. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> so... 
We're finally going to, well, not finally. This was pretty quick and painless, folks, wasn't it? But we're going to go to Ring of Honor's one-year anniversary show. It took place February 8th, 2003 at the Elks Lodge in New York, and it drew either 675 or 700 fans, depending on who you believe. Dave wrote in The Observer, 675. I saw other people say 700. But That 25-person you know, that, was- that, that uh, disparity is going to drive me nuts, which was it? It makes all the difference in the world, yeah. Matt. Uh, Dave wrote that reports are that the February 8th Ring of Honor debut in New York at the Elks Lodge in Queens was as good as any show in company history. They drew 675 fans, which was the largest crowd in the company's history and its largest crowd of late. I mean, hottest crowd of late. So one thing I want to bring up here is uh, there was a 2002, I think it was either, I think it was... No, September 2002, gave Sapolsky Torch Talk. And before I get into what I want to talk about, this is what sets it up. This is a quote from man, Gabe. Man, how did we miss that for so many months? <laughs> yeah, um, how we missed it, sadly, is uh, for Wrestling Torch to not have a free 10-day Black Friday trial that I could use to go log on and oh. get a bunch of Ring of Honor stuff. Oh. So now you'll get – not that um, – the Torch really only started se- seemingly to cover Ring of Honor a little bit in 2003, late 2002. So a lot, a, be... lot, a lot in 04, I would say. They were like, yes, there was. Wade was into it, yeah. Yeah, if you click the Ring of Honor like archive section in the VIP section of the Torch, there's just a lot more Ring of Honor content starting in 2004. Like more torch talks with guys like Samoa Joe and and things like that. Wade but, went through an ROH phase in early '04, and by '05 he was like mostly out of it again. <laughs> <laughs> Wade also went just through wrestling phases that he seemed to go out of. Like, is he in, uh, is this, he in, a, is he in a wrestling phase now? I don't know. He's trucking. You know, I'll give it to him. He's consistent, and he almost feels like a more a more, somewhat more interested Brian Alvarez, where. He's very much fallen into his pattern and his role. You know, he's the guy who talks to to Bruce, and he's the guy who takes emails and reads them and things like that, where he doesn't seem super passionate, but he doesn't – unlike Brian, I don't think he's falling asleep during the shows. Like, Yeah, yeah. I, I stopped you know reading The Torch years ago just because it didn't feel like Wade cared anymore. That was sort of yeah. how I – yeah, there was a point where the torch was worth reading just for like it would break news that the observer didn't and vice versa. And there was there was a point in the mid two thousands where the torch just dried up with news. So at some point it became like you had to like the editorial content and the podcast because really there wasn't anything you were gonna get from the torch news wise, you weren't gonna get else elsewhere. But you would get the torch talks and you would get this quote from Gabe in two thousand two where this is Gabe talking about Ring of Honor's touring ambitions. He wrote, or said, Our goal since day one was that you can take a seven to nine hour driving radius from Philadelphia, and let's see how many spots we can hit in there. The entire Northeast is just ripe for the taking right now. From Boston out to Worcester, to Rhode Island, to Connecticut, to all of New York State. But then he says, this aside, I think New York City is a dead market. Well, before you, Wash- go on, before you go on, I have to correct you because Joe Gagne is going to get really mad that you said Worcester, but it is pronounced Worcester. Oh, God, I screwed that up. I knew I was going to screw that I honestly like knew I was going to have to catch myself earlier, and then I forgot. Worcester. It's Worcester. Worcester man. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think New York City is a dead market to Washington, D.C., to Baltimore, to Pittsburgh, to all of Pennsylvania. Our goal is to make this a Northeast Territory. So – Pretty funny that Gabe is basically naming every Northeast city in the world, and except he singles out that New York City is a dead market, and here they are at the Elks Lodge, uh, probably four to five months later, um, and they're drawing their biggest crowd ever because Ring of Honor had only been at that point drawing anywhere from three to five hundred. They're drawing six hundred seventy-five to seven hundred at the Elks Lodge. Yeah, I'm fat. I'm you know like obviously a little bit defensive because it's my hometown, but like I'm fascinated as to how he drew that conclusion that New York was a dead market. Like I guess maybe just indies weren't doing well there. I guess that's the only thing I could think of. Um, but you know it is the place in the country that has the most people. So you'd think there's even if it's not as hot as other places. You'd think it would just because it had such a large pool to draw from would always be a place you'd want to try to run, but I don't know. I guess you know I'm not an expert on this stuff. 
Yeah, if you look at a, I also the other only other bit that might give some insight into that is on the if you go to the Wayback Machine and look up the early ROH website, they used to have a occasionally updated questions and answers section. And someone asked, I think I vaguely recall, like, "Are you ever going to come to New York?" Which was probably a question they were asked a fair bit. And they were like, "Well, it's expensive, but maybe if we grow bigger." And that was sometime the answer that somewhere probably in the middle of two thousand two. And this interview again probably came in. September of 2002. So it's funny that within four or five months, Gabe's mindset changed from New York City is a dead market to at least someone in the organization said, let's book the Elks Lodge. And it turned out well enough from Mike Johnson wrote, the promotion plans to run Queens several times a year for major events, but will not be running monthly shows as it isn't cost effective. They broke the record for attendance at the show and were highly appreciative of the fans. And then, to be fair, they never were back in actual like New York City proper again for more than two years after this. Because they found a spot right outside the city in New Jersey that I guess was more cost effective. So I have to think that it's a lot of the price thing. Yeah, I, they, they probably felt like I would be interested in seeing where the thing you keep seeing over and over again in the Torch Talks and Dave is, oh, Ring of Honor is budgeted to do okay if they get between four and 500 fans at live events. I'd be interested in how their margins go when they draw 700 in New York, but how much of that gets eaten up by the rent. You yeah, know? I mean, I 2003 Queens, you know, I don't know how the rent was compared to, say, now. That's kind of it's kind of hard to say, um, but I you know just I wasn't renting <laughs> at that time. In my life. I was still, <laughs> you weren't booking buildings back then, not yeah, like you are now. I was still in. I mean, now I think I feel like I have some awareness of just the expense of the city, but I was still in college at the time. I didn't really wasn't really thinking about it, and um, I, I don't know. I, I feel like probably whatever they drew in the Elks Lodge was probably they lost more money than they would have lost drawing a lot less than that in South Philly. Yeah, I, I mean, they're, they're obviously, if they were making good money there, they would have come back more frequently into New York proper at this time. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, they drew, they drew a good crowd, so obviously there's just they probably just booked it once they thought you know it's the prestige of it and this was their biggest show they had done up to that point you know the Alex lodge definitely has a very specific look and atmosphere and again the prestige of saying oh we ran new york city yep so i can see why they would do it even if it didn't necessarily make financial sense but now we can finally get to the release proper the first thing we see is a dimly lit shot of a cake with Ring of Honor first anniversary written on it in frosting. Then they do a spinny video effect on the cake. Then like a negative like colorization effect, like ooh crazy cake. And uh, the ooh, cake, crazy uh, cake. <laughs> How many wrestling shows do you think have elicited that emotion? Ooh, crazy cake. <laughs> I was about to say, Matt, we're gonna. I'm gonna say something that no one has ever said in a wrestling podcast ever, which is that cake will come into play later. Actually, you know, someone could have said that about like a cake angle. Yeah, I, I, I would. I feel pretty confident that that has actually been said. God damn it! I thought we were breaking ground, but. We will, but not not on that. <laughs> Next, we go to a segment I'm sure Matt enjoyed, which is Loki cutting a promo, and he's walking down the snowy streets of New York at night. Repeating, talks about how- repeating one year ago. <laughs> <laughs> Loki loves repeating. Yeah, loves starting. And- he loves starting a sentence with the same phrase. <laughs> he talks about how Ring of Honor's been around for a year, one year ago, and says that within the year. Quote, a lot of things have happened to each individual, unquote, who has stepped foot in Ring of Honor. And I wrote at the time, that sounds like something you'd write in a book report when you're trying to meet the word count. Like, a lot of things have happened to each individual here. Yeah, Yes, Loki. That's kind of the definition of existence. Mm Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, there's not much to it. The, I, I Even as corny as low-key promos are, I did – seeing as how he was basically the man in Ring of Honor for the first six months and this is the first anniversary show, I did like them kind of bookending – I mean starting the show with low-key. Yeah, he's the right guy to tell the story of the first year, yeah. I guess. Even if he's not the greatest guy to cut a promo, symbolically, he's the good face to present. Mm-hmm. And then we get a hot music video, highlight video, covering the first year of Ring of Honor. 
followed by many the first of many black and white clips of key moments we're going to see throughout the show. Like they're going to have these flashback black and white clips of great moments or memorable moments from the first year. Like, like Started, those WrestleMania moments they would show on TV before WrestleMania um, up until pretty recently, I guess. Do they still do that? They don't do that anymore, right? Uh, I'm not sure. I probably skip that when I watch Raw, even on the WrestleMania season nowadays. I do a lot of fast forwarding, but um, when I when, even when I do watch, but the first clip we get is low key American Dragon at uh, Era of and Christopher Daniels at Era of Honor begins, and clips of that. One thing I'll note is. I don't know if I'm going to mention all of these. We're always trying to keep these podcasts in a timely manner, believe it or not. Like, not not just a timely delivery manner, but, like, a good length. And so I'll briefly mention them, but if I feel like the podcast is going long, I might just start omitting them. Just know that there's a lot of these clips throughout the show. And, in fact, I'm of the belief after watching the show that they probably, if they really wanted to, could have edited this show down to a three-hour single tape release. And because I think if you just eliminated these clips alone, you probably would have saved ten or more minutes, like just off these flashback clips. It's a nice thing to do, but there's a lot of them. Yeah, I agree with that. I also think that, like, um, you know, we've talked about all these things before, so there's no really reason for us to go into them. Yeah, I'll just skip them. Just assume basically every key moment of Ring of Honor is going to be shown of the first year. A lot of them are going to be shown between matches. In black and white. Yes, in black and white because that's old timey and classic. It is classic. (laughs) For some reason that cracked me up. Um, We cut to Paul London. He's wheeling his luggage outside the building. Cuts a quick promo saying he let the fans down when he lost to Xavier at Final Battle, but that he's going to give it a hundred thousand percent this time, and that he can't say anything to make Low Key and AJ Styles, his opponents for tonight, sound better than they already are because they're great. And at this point, Paul London was just such a nice young man. He really was a nice young man. He still wasn't good at promos, but no. he was likable, and that's really yes. all you need. Mm-hmm. Like just the ultimate bland, like in personality wise, like likable, handsome, young, white, meat, baby face. Mm-hmm. And finally, first match of the show, a four corner match. And that will be Chad Collier taking on Colt Cabana, taking on Michael Shane, taking on Easy Money. And Easy Money wins this match. It's one fall to a finish. He wins in 15 minutes, 18 seconds when he pins Collier after hitting the cha-ching, which is kind of like a like a suplex into a release power bomb. Chris Hero does a, or I guess Cassius Ono now does a very similar move. And this was originally, I don't know what the two singles matches were supposed to be, but this was originally supposed to be two singles matches. And on the ring of honor site, they liked how the four way on the last show revenge on the prophecy turned out so much. They decide just to combine the two singles matches into a four way um, Matt, how did you feel about this match? And do you think that was a good decision? Yeah, I do think it was a good decision. I think that, you know, maybe the two singles matches would have been good or even better in some ways. But I think that, you know, I'm not sure how much the crowd would have cared about these four guys in two separate matches. Whereas this was like, you know, a bunch of guys on the rise or in Shane's, uh, in Shane's, uh, case on the decline. Um, <laughs> and they, uh, you know, they just kind of had an all action match, um, the atmosphere helped a lot. You know, I think just being the first match in this atmosphere, is, you know, it definitely felt like a bigger show. You know, that this place has a balcony, which no other ROH event has had. The crowd was hot. Um, I did notice that as this is the first time that I really noticed the crowd be uh, behaving in a way that I was like, oh, this is a douchey crowd. Because Jason Jet, or if I call him Jason Jet, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I really do think of him as Jason Jet, which is weird because he was Jason Jet for like, what, a month? Ever, but um, so, that would have been your first exposure to him, wouldn't it? Though, if you were just following WCW, I mean, well, as I, Jason I, Jett. I saw him in ECW first. I just mm. he made an impression on me as Jason Jet. I will say that I remember <laughs> thinking, like, oh, he's really good. Um, so that probably was more of it. But I, so he, so Easy Money went through a handspring back elbow, and he like landed on his head very roughly, and then like caught himself and went for a back elbow, and the crowd chanted, "You fucked up!" at him really loudly. And I don't recall a loud you fucked up chant at any of the Philly shows in ROH. You know, maybe like a little smattering here and there, but this was like a, a solid, loud you fucked up chant that people got into. And I, I like, thought hey. of you. Oh, sorry. I 
I thought of you when I saw that spot because you always like when I always talk about how crowds back then were more douchey than today. You're always like, oh well, New York crowds I think are still fairly douchey in some ways. Or nor-. And I'm always, and I, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, Matt's probably right because he's there. But I'm like, maybe Matt's being a bit hard on them. And then this is like the first time in a long time that someone's done that in Ring of Honor, like a crowd. And I was like, God damn it, Matt's right. <laughs> Yeah, well, the thing that really, I think I might have mentioned this on the show before, the thing that really, in recent years, really made me think, like, oh, New York crowds are still just kind of negative assholes, was the whole thing with the belt, the universal belt at SummerSlam 2016, where they unveiled the belt against in the Rollins versus uh, Baylor match, and the crowd just didn't give the match a chance just because they didn't like the way the belt looked, and, mm-hmm. like, ruined the whole match. And I was like, Jesus Christ, what is wrong with people? Like, why do you come to things? <laughs> uh, so that and so that that was that sort of what made me be like, yeah, New York crowds are still assholes. But anyway, um, the match. <laughs> uh, I thought that everyone looked pretty decent. I thought even Shane looked better than he had in a while. Um, not like he he wasn't a standout in the match. I think he was probably the least impressive in the match. But the crowd was really on him. You know, maybe because they were a few DVDs behind, so he was still a hot heel the last time they saw him. <laughs> I'm actually I'm actually kind of serious there, because um, I would say he was he he had some heat on him as a heel all the way up through like probably the Tommy Dreamer angle at All Star Extravaganza, and I think there is a decent chance that that was the last show that any of these people had seen. Yeah, I mean I, th- I think that's a great point. You know, if someone like in rare examples like a guy like Michael Shane who's had um, a very precipitous like quick decline or rise and only within a few months it's going to take a little time for the crowd to catch up to that yes i agree and, and as such shane seemed like a much more overact on this show and um they sort of did a thing with um with shane and um and collier working over easy money and then cabana got the hot tag and he really did it like a pretty decent very traditional hot tag and you know just go through a little they had their, had their dive fest um where um, uh, Collier did a tope onto Cabana on the floor. Then Money did a double clothesline on the floor onto both. And then Shane did a flip dive onto Money. And, th- and th- there was a moment here where I th- where I thought, um, so like the, the the three guys are on the floor and Shane is in the ring about to do a dive. And then he does it. He just does his dive. And I was thinking like one thing that would be different in 2017 is that Michael Shane would not have done a dive there. Right, he would have teased doing a dive and then like done something else to get the crowd to boo. Don't you mm-hmm. think? Yeah, that's a classic heel move nowadays, where you tease the dive and then like right before you jump through the ropes, you like stop and like wave your arms, like oh, I'm not doing it for you people. And yeah. then sometimes, occasionally, you get them like the flip of that, where then a baby face comes in and like throws them over the top anyway, or stuff like that. But yeah, I feel like. It wasn't the the dive train was still novel enough that you didn't have to people didn't feel the need to kind of do flip variations of that to keep it fresh. It was just like, oh, dive trains are cool. Let's make sure everyone dives. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So this was a fun, simple all action match. I would say, you know, slightly above average, uh, entertaining. You know, not like a really good match or anything, but I thought it did what it needed to do. Yeah, I, I agree. I like a very low good, high about like just just not nothing special, but it was a solid match. It's interesting where the first two thirds of this match, a lot of it are worked just like a tag match, even though it's four corners, because a lot of it is Shane and Collier kind of teaming together as if they're a tag team and just isolating easy money and preventing him from tagging Colt Cabana, and then, as you mentioned, Colt gets a very traditional tag-team-style hot tag where he runs wild, and it was the right choice to beat down Easy Money because he was clearly the most over guy of the four, which is interesting because he had only had the one match in Ring of Honor, but I guess that ECW history, you know, got people going for him. It really does make a big difference. He probably wrestled in ECW in that building. Yeah, exactly. So local stuff does matter in that respect. And I thought it was like going back to the the spot you talked about, the that's the most memorable spot, the fuck up, where he doesn't even blow the handspring and the ropes into the back elbow. Like he still pulls off the move. It just looks really ugly. But I guess one of the things that kind of like bugged me about them doing the you fucked up was 
Easy Money was clearly the most over wrestler before that, and like they still couldn't forgive him for that. Like they, it wasn't like a no name that fucked up a move or guy or a heel they didn't like. It was the guy they were most behind and enjoying, and he fucks up one move, and then they still have to do their snarky, you know, you fucked up bullshit. Just because I think at that time. Fans just loved chanting that for some reason. And yeah, they some really like, made them feel cool. They were really like they didn't. They weren't chanting it in disappointment or anger. They were chanting it in joy. Yeah, which is, makes they, it worse, I think. Yeah, they they liked doing it. Even even if it was a guy they liked, you know, they were still going to do it just as hard and just as loud. But um, the five the the first ten minutes are kind of in some ways like very basic. The last five minutes get pretty exciting but overall yeah just a somewhat above average match it's crazy to see how far michael shane has fallen in just a few months where around the time uh, as you mentioned before you know all-star extravaganza might have been the last thing these fans saw as a home release around that time he seemed pretty hot they gave him the tommy dreamer moment they get, you know he had the great match unscripted with paul london with the, the street fight with the ladder and everything and at that time in the observer they said hey like ring of honor's got plan big plans to push michael shane and then you look here it's the biggest show ring of honor's run yet and Michael Shane is in a random four-way n- opening the show and not even winning the match. Like, it, it's crazy to think in just a few months how much they just, I don't know, soured might be too strong a word, but maybe not. Like, just they lost interest in whatever reason and or lost faith in him. They aren't quite done with him yet, though. He does become part of an angle later in the show. Yeah, yes. Oh, and one other thing I'll mention is Easy Money, like, he is interesting to watch as a like somewhat bigger guy who still does like the innovative flippy moves and he does have some real fun moments but when he screws up it looks bad but one thing i can't abide by is his clotheslines look really awkward and bad and he insists on throwing them quite a bit like that was his big dive was a double clothesline yeah, there's something about a lot of his jumping clotheslines when he comes off top ropes, and I've seen it in more than th- this match, where it's like he holds his arm out and then jumps, and he doesn't really move his arm. So the, the his clothesline looks like it's just like, it just happens to hit the other guy's body. He's not swinging it like a weapon, or really, it's just like, I'm going to stick my arm out, and then I'm going to jump towards you, and what's going to happen is what's going to happen. And it's something, it's a clothesline he does regularly, so... Um, if you can't do something great, maybe you, it shouldn't be something you do like multiple variations of often. But I mean, again, solid opener. Nothing you're going to remember. He's not an ECW for very much long. I'm not ECW. ROH for very much longer. <laughs> He's not an ECW much longer either. And that's the other interesting thing is, you know, Easy Money's over here. He gets to win a match over Colt Cabana, Michael Shane, Chad Collier. And he, yeah, he isn't around much longer. Just two or three more shows, I think. And he's he's done. So yep. another, and also for people who watch the show, look for the easy easy uh, tights dot com, I think, or something like that. Um, written on the back of his tights, easy money moonlighted as a guy who made ring gear for wrestlers. I think his website is still up, and it was last updated in twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen. I don't know if he's still making gear, but easy tights dot com. If you want to see uh, easy money's handiwork, he has lots of examples. Of tights he's made for wrestlers. Nowhere near as controversial as Jinx clothing. <laughs> no, it is no. I mean, nothing is as controversial <laughs> as Jinx clothing, Matt. No, nope. nothing. Certainly nothing that's happened this year. No. Next, we get a very short AJ Styles promo. He's walking up some stairs backstage. He tells us he's going to be in a tough match tonight, and his goal is to get the Ring of Honor title away from the prophecy. Speaking of bland babyface promos. Yeah, AJ Styles, also another guy who would get more charisma out of the ring as time went on. Next up, we have the Texas Wrestling Academy of Don Juan, Fast Eddie, and Hot Stuff Hernandez, escorted to the ring by their trainer, Rudy Boy Gonzalez, taking on and defeating the Carnage crew of DeVito, Loke, and Masada by disqualification. In five minutes, 42 seconds, when the Carnage crew basically just decided to start hitting everyone with hubcaps. So, this is your classic from the first year, your Ring of Honor. We get up-and-comers from Texas to travel 26 hours, and then we give them under 
like five minutes of match time. I mean, this was slightly over, but it's a six man tag that didn't go six minutes. It's one of those things that feels pointless, but in a way, I guess when you're doing a first anniversary show and trying to kind of pay tribute to the first year, what better way to pay tribute to the first year than do something you've done a few times, which is bring in like underwhelming prospects from TWA and have Rudy boy drive them there and then give them almost no ring time. (laughs) But this match, I mean, obviously 542, there's not much going on. There's not much you can see. Don Juan continues to be the most, I mean, the least imposing looking wrestler I've ever seen in my life. He gets beat down for a while. For the fir- first minute, the TWA guys get to run wild. Um, hot Stuff Hernandez hits a really nice uh, hot tag where he just does three really good clotheslines. Easy money, take note on the Carnage crew. Yeah, easy money. Take some note now. <laughs> it's never too late to get back into wrestling, That It's certainly never too late to take note. <laughs> we took notes. I definitely take notes. Yeah, um, yeah there's not much to this. It, it wasn't hor- unwatchable or horrible or anything. Um, Fast Eddie, I felt bad for him because apart from the annoying, the obligatory, he's legally blind comment that has to be said by the commentators in every Fast Eddie match in history, Gabe at one point mentions that Fast Eddie um, is from New York and that 15 members of his family and friends paid to see him tonight. And I thought, boy, I hope they enjoyed like the 80 seconds of ring time (laughs) Fast Eddie got tonight in this match. No, they're all legally blind too, so they couldn't see what was going on. They didn't even know. They thought that he was Paul London, actually. Oh, that's why I saw those opera glasses in the balcony. I yeah. thought they were just got yeah. confused about what event they were going to. Yeah. But uh, Fast Eddie, you should know, takes the most memorable spot in this match, other than maybe the hot stuff for Hernandez hot tag, where uh, he's doing an acai moonsault to the floor. And this is what causes the DQ, I think. And mid moonsault, where he's upside down, one of the Carnage crew guys hits him in the head with a hubcap. So that was pretty crazy. And that was pretty much the end of the match as well. Yeah. At that point, they run in and start beating everyone down. Uh, before I get to what happened after the match, do you have really any thoughts on a very... Again, it wasn't unentertaining, but it's, it was a six-man tag that went under six minutes and ended in a DQ. I basically have two comments, two very small comments. Um, first one, Hernandez I thought was impressive. I... Um, Big clotheslines and slams onto Masada. I thought his strikes looked good. He doesn't really get to do much in ROH over, overall. He has a couple more matches in 2003, I think, and that's about it, right? Yeah. And then the other thing... So the whole thing with the Carnage crew is like they're like, oh, we have our ugly wives and we just want to get out and beat some people up. And amazingly, in wrestling, in 2003, Ray Murrow, a.k.a. Doug Gentry, actually has a empathetic anti-patriarchal comment that you would never expect to hear in wrestling where he goes, can you imagine being married to them? I think their wives would want to get out of the house. (laughs) And I was like, wow, like that's like full on feminist by 2003 ring of honor standards that they, (laughs) that they give agency to these poor women that are married to Loken DeVito in, even if it's only a throwaway commentary line. So I was like, good on you, Doug Gentry. You're a good man. (laughs) Um, other than that, no, there's, I have nothing to say about this match. (laughs) Oh, uh, actually, I did remember a couple things. I can't believe I remembered anything I wanted to say about this. One thing is your commentary line reminded me. I think um, Gabe makes a comment during this match about how DeVito's getting fatter, which I just thought was funny. Like, you could like you could almost hear Gabe smile during it, how he's just kind of like, <laughs> DeVito's put on a lot of weight since, the, you know, he first came to Ring of Honor or something like that. Yeah, Gabe thinks he's so funny getting to make fun of wrestlers on commentary. <laughs> I, bet you, I bet you the wrestlers do are like what the fuck what? like shut up asshole like i i, I really <laughs> bet they're, they're they're not too cool with that because you know gabe's not an athlete <laughs> and Is lord it? knows i mean gabe wouldn't like put on weight from the start of his ring of honor tenure or anything i am not but, call, i am not calling gabe an asshole i'm saying the wrestlers when he makes fun of them probably think that he is let's make that clear let's yes. make that clear folks you got I'll, the clips i'm a big fan of gabe spolsky's wrestling promotions as you might notice <laughs> If you've listened to like any us podcast, and- any podcast I've ever been on. <laughs> um, the other thing, did you notice this spot? This has to be one of the dumbest spots I've seen in recent time. Um, 
Don Juan does a move on somebody. I think he does like some kind of moonsault or something. And instead of get off the guy, he lies on top of the guy's body. And the and his opponent, I forget which member of the Carnage crew, is down with his shoulders against the canvas. And the ref's just staring and not counting. And I'm going, why isn't the ref counting? Like he's in a pinfall position. And then Fast Eddie, and then I realize why, it's Fast Eddie is doing his own moonsault off the ropes and I guess Don Juan is supposed to be holding the opponent down, which seems ridiculous. And Fast Eddie hits the moonsault on top of Don Juan, who's on top of the member of the Carnage crew. And then Don Juan pops up like nothing has happened, and he and Fast Eddie, like, salute the crowd or something. And I thought, why, after you hit a moonsault, wouldn't you just leave? Like, who who would ever moonsault a guy and then, like, okay, I'm going to slide on top of him. You moonsault me, too. Like, and then act like being part of a wrestler sandwich was no big deal it wasn't a big thing but it was just such a weird awkward moment that stood out in my mind like where i was thinking why is anyone counting the pin oh wait this is happening it was nice to see rudy boy again right it's been a while yeah he has i don't know if this is rudy boy's last appearance or not i'm not sure it's not oh yeah yeah my memory on stuff like that is bad but yeah it was nice to see again it's one of those things like the low-key promo at the start where it doesn't necessarily add a ton to the show in entertainment value but if you've been watching every show it's like yeah it's nice to see him here for the one year anniversary like because he has been a part of ring of honor's first year yes so post-match speaking of things that are slightly progressive um, the Carnage crew continue their beat down until YMCA kicks in over the PA and Mace comes out with the returning Buffy. Yes, the Christopher Street connection are back. They proceed to run wild on the Carnage crew, beating them up two on three, uh, even though they're outnumbered. They have the help of some exploding confetti party favors and they run wild and Gabe and Doug, like, you know, they still do a bit of that. Oh, like, you know, they're entertaining, they're wild and wacky, but it, it was something to see in New York City, like, again, talking about how far we've come in one year of Ring of Honor shows, where the first show starts with one of the most homophobic angles in wrestling history, and then here they are coming out beating the three, three of the manliest men in Ring of Honor, handy, they're beating them down two on three as this huge babyface comeback moment as the crowd, like, loves them. Yeah, see, this is what I was telling you about, um, you know... Uh, you know, on the way to this was, um, you know, by this time, they're basically baby faces. And this is, I think, their official face turn, right? Like, this, they weren't, like, officially baby faces in any angle before this. But now they 100% are, and the crowd treats them as such. So, uh, and the announcers, for the most part, treat them ex- ex- uh, as such, except for one little, uh, which I'm not yeah. really crazy about. Um, but hey, uh, it's small victories, right? Yeah, it, it, it's it's just interesting how far they've come. Not even like I feel like they've gotten more progressive. It's just like I think the crowd always loved the Christopher Street connection, like especially on, even on that first Air of Honor Begins show. They they loved that gimmick, but it's like the book – it's like Gabe's caught up with that. Like, oh, yeah, people like this gimmick. You know, it's not something that we should use as fodder to show like, oh, this is what Ring of Honor isn't. Fun characters. Ugh. Like, no, now it's just like, oh, yeah, this is – they're they're outlandish, but they're entertaining. And we don't have to just treat them as like guys to get killed by the hit squad whenever you go into a new city. Yeah, it's like um, they don't have to worry about being so insecure – about somebody calling them a fun character, you know, like <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm I'm not a fun character. I'm a very serious wrestler. Right? It's like like that's that's what they would always say when they were like 12 years old, right? They hated yeah. being called fun characters. <laughs> Matt, we're all quite well. I was gonna say you're quite a character, or I was gonna say we're 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 quite characters, but then that wouldn't make sense. And I'm not really a character. Let's edit out this clip and go to something much better. I'm not editing but, it. <laughs> I know you aren't. Um, we go to the next, and what Gabe advertised at the time, which t- wouldn't turn out to be the case, the final ever Battle of the Briscoes. M- Jay Briscoe taking on Mark Briscoe in a rematch of the great uh, Honor Invades Boston match. This time, Jay wins. He gets his win back. He beats Mark Briscoe via pinfall. In 16 minutes, 40 seconds, after he hit three consecutive J-drillers, Matt, I'll let you um, 
give your thoughts in a second, but I guess the thing we should note before the match starts, I mean, before we talk about like the contents of the match is that Gabe informs us right at the start of the match. And we see Mark kneeling down to pray that Mark and Jay have dedicated this match to one of uh, Mark's friends, one of his best friends named Brock, who played on his football team, who died in a car accident uh, not long before this, I guess, in month in the recent months before the show. Uh, apparently, Mark, Mark, we can see Mark has armbands in support of him and apparently even a tattoo in honor of him. Uh, Gabe sells this as like the Briscoes feud is over now, that they've moved on and they're going to start teaming together. But this match is just the last thing they need to get out of the way. And the only thing that ring a little false to me is he's also like, you know, Mark isn't in the prophecy anymore. You know, he's moved on and stuff like that. It like... I real it, it felt a little weird that you're using like a real life friend's death to basically write off the entire feud. Not that this wasn't going to be the feud ender no matter what, but like basically Gabe is like they end this match isn't for the most part wrestled like they hate each other. This is wrestled like like again, like what Gabe's explained. Like they've already made up and this is just one last thing they have to do before they move on. Yeah, there was a part of me that was like, oh, that's a little bit icky that they're using this. Um, but then I was like, you know what? Obviously, probably everyone involved was okay with it. Life is too short to get offended by something like that at this point, that ha- especially when it happened 15 years ago. So I just decided to accept it for, at face value that uh, the, this was that they were going to use that that person's death to to alter Mark Briscoe's character. I don't know if they were planning on doing that anyway. I can't imagine that Mark Briscoe was like, my friend died, so now I can't be a heel. Like, yeah. I, I, so I, I think that there must be some other motivation behind why that's happening. Um, you know, and Gabe did foreshadow them being a tag team for a while before. And obviously mm-hmm. they're brothers, so it's common sense that they'd be a tag team once Mark could start wrestling all the time. And he is 18 now, according to uh, the commentary. So... Um, so yeah, I think they still do the little prayer kneel thing even now, right? Uh, I think does. so. Yeah, yeah. And again, I mean, Mark got a tattoo, so this was a close friend, probably. Yeah, yeah this was obviously and, a very close friend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as the match, um, yeah, I liked it. I, 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 you know, it's, it's like the first match was better because it was different. It was like a real heated, like, you know, serious match. It wasn't just like an indie match. It was, you know, they told a story. This was a lot more of like what you'd expect from them as really good indie wrestlers mm-hmm. in 2003. And in that sense, it was good. Um, they had really good moves. You know, by the end, it got really intense. They, you know, they, because, you know, they, they did the wrestling stuff early. Mark does a spot where he's like playing possum in order to, that he's hurt. Then he pops up and fights Jay. So he still has a little bit of the, uh, you know, the heelish stuff in him. You know, do some good dives. And then, um, Mark, uh, you know, posts Jay and Jay ble- blades, so it does get intense. But then they make note that unlike in the first match, Mark does not attack Jay's cut. He just lets him, you know, he ble- Jay is bleeding, but Mark doesn't exploit it in the mm-hmm. same way. Um, and then they do the the big near fall stuff at the end. Um, and it's funny, you know, I, I you know said early that the Jay Driller gets kicked out of a lot. Obviously, at this point, I think I can clearly say I was wrong, but it does <laughs> finally get kicked out of the sec- a second time here, except it is not Jay that does it, it is Mark that does it, and Jay kicks out and then hits a series of Jay drillers on Mark, like where he doesn't even let go, and he gets three um, based on that. And the crowd really liked it, um, and I, re- I thought it was really good. I thought it was a very good match. It just wasn't like a transcendent match, because it was much more of just a typical what you'd expect as an indie match. Um, kind of a traditional baby face you know, head droppy, big spot match, which was still good for what it was. They were definitely still very good for their age, like really, really good. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't special in the same way as that other match. Uh, I agree completely. Um, people who've listened to every episode, as you should, you should listen to them all multiple times to get all the nuances. You of should be listening I... to another one right now as you're listening to this one, just to get, <laughs> you know, just to get it all in. It's like that, what was that Flaming Lips album where it was like three CDs you were supposed to play on three CD players at the same time? Like, Yeah, exactly. It's like that. You're supposed to listen to every episode on a different device at the same time. But, no, I completely agree with you about this match. People have listened to 
um, our episode where we covered the first match of theirs at Honor Invades Boston, their first Ring of Honor match. Well, no, we both really like that match. I love that match. I want to have its babies and teach them not to be homophobic you like actually, the Briscoes. You actually have had its babies. <laughs> uh, I got custody taken away from me. So The match but, is raising the kids. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, this is very good. That that other first match was great. This is just very good. And as Matt said, Matt summed it up perfectly. That first match, what made it great was it still had, like, all the fun the level of action you'd want from a big modern indie match, but had, you know, story and some emotion and a lot of little detail work and selling. This is just do a lot of exciting, cool things in a wrestling match. There's very modern indie. It's not, there's not much story or nuance to it at all. There is the fun bit about Mark playing possum. There is a tiny bit of what you would call, I guess, simple psychology of M- Jay keeps going through the, for the J driller. Mark avoids it. Then Mark is the one that hits it. Like Matt said, and then Jay wins with the three. So they kind of thread the J driller throughout the match. And yes, so Matt, we can add it to the list at least that Mark kicked out of the J. Someone kicked out of the J driller. And ironically it was Jay, <laughs> but, um, there was one spot I actually really liked that's such a little weird spot, but I think I, I would like the spot more than most people, but it's Mark hits a springboard ace crusher off the ropes and he goes for another and he's standing on the ropes and Jay and Mark start fighting like Jay's punching him and they're both on the ropes and you know, Jay doesn't want to get hit him again with another ace crusher off the ropes. And what I like about this is I feel a lot of times in wrestling, it would literally, they would just do, Mark would hit Jay with the ace crusher off the ropes. They'd, they'd set it up again, and instantly Jay would hit the ace crusher. And they don't do it like that. They do it here where Mark hits it. Then they do a couple moves or whatever. They go back to that spot, and Mark and Jay have this fairly prolonged like punching battle back and forth, fighting over it. And you would think, okay, well, Jay's going to win it. No, Mark wins the strike battle. But then even then, just as he's jumping, in mid-jump, Jay catches him and hits his own ace crusher. And there's something about, like, just going that extra mile to make it a bit of a struggle rather than you do a move, then I'll counter the move when you try it again. Like, actually making a bit of a battle over it and then even having the guy that wins the battle still getting caught. Like, those are the things that make matches, like, feel less like moves and more like a collection of moves and more like a struggle and a match. And... A lot of this match, because it didn't have those story elements of the first match and that good selling, did feel like a collection of really cool spots these guys have probably thought of over weeks and months. But stuff like that is what can... The Indies in general did a good job like having like struggles on the top rope back then. You can see that a lot in ROH at this time. I don't think you really see it too much now anywhere. I mean, occasionally you would, I know Chris Hero would still do that because I love me some struggle on the top rope spots. I, I really like those spots for a lot of reasons that I can get into on my other show, just, um, top rope memories, which is nothing but me talking about matches that have top rope struggle spots, but this is a show that's got to maybe made. I, I <laughs> need to hear this. Uh, um, top rope memories. <laughs> <laughs> so th- Yeah, but this was still a good match. But it's a match where it's as good. It's as good as it is, just because it's mind candy. It's just like I just wrote in my notes like a paragraph of cool things, and they don't really hang together, or really they're just cool things. Like they, um, Mark and Jay have this crazy hockey, intense hockey brawl on the outside where they're throwing forearms really hard, and. Um, Jay does a really brutal torture rack into a backbreaker on, um, Mark, um, the Mark playing possum thing. There's a moment where Jay's on his back and then Mark is standing and he stretches his leg all the way up to catch Mark around the back of his head and pull him a standing Mark back into a leg scissors. That was cool. Um, Mark does a moonsault from the top rope to the floor and Gabe actually kind of interesting because this was their frenemy competitor but he actually brings up that that's shades of their ccw best of the best match so it was interesting that gabe actually called that promotion out by name and it was like hey that's a that's a spot from a show they did for another promotion so again none of these things really like if you're looking for selling story like no but there's enough cool stuff they work really hard and i guess the only other weird thing about it would be going back to the start 
it is a bit weird. I like. I don't know how you felt. I, I'd be interesting to interested to hear. But it is a bit weird that we had this feud, and then the feud is kind of settled off camera. Like there's no. It felt like this could have at least used a backstage segment or something. Like literally, this match is wrestled very sportingly, unlike the other matches. There's no hate or anything. They're completely, for the most part, just mono a mono even and not angry at each other anymore and the entire feud is written off in the first two minutes of gabe on commentary explaining the brock death you know mark's friend dying explaining you know that mark doesn't want to be in the prophecy anymore that they're going to be a tag team all this stuff like it feel it felt strangely almost unsatisfying that there were, we didn't get to see mark and jay settle the feud either in the match and then come to an understanding through the match or even just in a backstage segment, like of all the times you could have used a backstage segment just to say like, Mark, I know you've been through a lot. Like, let's put this aside. You're my brother. I love you. You can tag with me in any city now. Cause you're 18. Like they don't do it. Like they Gabe basically ends the story in commentary. Yeah. I don't know what to say about that. I don't know what the reason is or why I'm mean, in the end. It wasn't a huge deal. You know, maybe they didn't trust those guys to do angles work because, I mean, they still weren't good on the mic at all. Um, I don't know. Or maybe Mike, Mark really did just say, you know, enough of this shit. I just want to be a team with my brother. Maybe that maybe that really did happen. I mean, I think going back to what you said before, it was always their plan probably for the Briscoes to be a tag team once Mark turned 18. Because as we mentioned on the Scramble Madness podcast, there's a line where Gabe literally spells out what the, what the future of this feud is going to be, where he says something to the effect of, oh, if Mark hadn't joined the prophecy, I think they would have had one more match and then agreed to be a tag team. But now that's all out the window. Like, clearly Gabe knew where this was going. and But for some reason, he decides to use the Brock thing to just completely end the angle before the final match even starts. It, but it's funny that they said at the beginning this would be their last match against each other and that was ever. definitely not close to true. Yeah, wasn't even their last match against each other in Ring of Honor. Nope. I mean it would be for a while but yeah, very, gave multiple times very declarative that like this is the last time you'll see Jay versus Mark Briscoe and no. Yeah, not, in wrestling it's very dangerous to say that anything is the last time any that anything happens ever. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I realize he wanted to really sell the point of they're going to be a tag team after this, and he sells a few times like how exciting the tag division is going to be with the Briscoes, but yeah, you never say never in wrestling, ever. Well, I guess I just said that, because I just told you to never say never. Sometimes... You're not in wrestling, kid, you're just a wannabe. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought this was going to be my big break, mm. but... So after that match, we get the Hit Squad doing a promo high on a roof or a balcony somewhere with the New York below them at night. We can see lots of traffic. This turns out to be a horrible place to cut a promo because you can barely make out their faces at times <laughs> and the wind is blowing into the camera. It's so for, It's for the best. <laughs> yeah. that, that's some top-level Matt Byrne there. <laughs> if you're making a Matt Byrne comp keep that as a highlight for near the end of the comp. Um, anyway, they cut the same rah, rah, ring of honor promo. They always do the thing. Only thing just like celebrating the fan, the first year, thanking the fans. The thing I noticed is mafia is wearing his Ribeiro steakhouse jacket. And I wonder what the style guide on Ribeiro steakhouse jackets are. Like, I know it's a big deal when you work in Japan to go to the Ribeiro steakhouse and get this, the jacket. But like, is it gauche to, uh, wear the jacket? Like, uh, is it, is it, I always thought it was supposed to be one of those things where like you get the jacket and then you say you have the jacket, but you don't actually wear the jacket. Especially not on camera. It's like tisk, wearing tisk, tisk. It's like wearing the t-shirt of a band at the ba- concert of the ba- of the same band. Like he's being that guy. <laughs> being that guy. I um also Monsa Max says that this this show is one year later, one year to the day. And it's, de- it's definitely not, like, not even close. It's like, this is, like, early February. That was late February, right? So this is, like, yeah. almost, like, three weeks off from one year to the day. <laughs> I never noticed that. <laughs> um, and we get one more backstage promo of Homicide. Homicide. He knows that New York is his home as well as Low Key and the Hit Squad's home. He says Steve Creel's going to the hospital tonight. And he does a little foreshadowing, saying that he has his own gang of thugs to match Carino's. So, hinting at something that's going to come very soon, which is Steve Carino versus Homicide. Before the match starts, 
Carino gets in the ring, gets on the mic, and he talks about the current members of his still unnamed stable, Simply Luscious and Samoa Joe. He talks about them a little bit. They're in the ring with him. Immediately afterwards, he introduces two new members to his stable, the first being Michael Shane and the second being C.W. Anderson, who comes out to continue his shitty work shoot angle, feuding with Gabe for those who haven't been keeping up with our show and Ring of Honor. Um, C.W. worked one show for Ring of Honor early on. He was supposed to work the next show, but had already booked a zero one tour and didn't tell Gabe. Apparently they were like ring of Honor was really pissed about him somewhere along the way. They decided to turn it into a work shoot where CW came back for a show in late 2002, where he just barged in and cut a shoot promo on Gabe Sapolsky. So now they continue that here where we can see, um, Gabe and Rob Feinstein standing on the stage and then walking out because they're so infuriated with CW Anderson being back. And this was at a time when, this Creole's group really started to lean more into this really annoying, weird, like they're not booked. They book themselves. Like he's not supposed to be on the mic right now, but we can't stop him. Like they can do whatever they want. They like, say multiple times about them going off script, which is the most annoying thing that you can do in wrestling is talk about somebody going off the script. And I was watching a Steve Creno interview where he was saying the whole point of his group in Ring of Honor was that they book themselves. Like that was their idea, like that they they don't do anything that they, they don't want to do. They just barge in. And the idea that like I don't get how we're supposed to believe that Steve Carino, C.W. Anderson and, and these guys are so powerful that like. Gabe and Rob are powerless to stop them as they do whatever they want, barge in whenever they want, book whatever they want. Like in the past with the prophecy, they've used the excuse of, oh, they have the title, so we have to listen to what they want because they could run off with our titles. Well, at this point, Carino's group doesn't have any titles. So, But Steve um, Carino is such a gigantic international <laughs> superstar. <laughs> um, 2003. The- <laughs> The funny part is, too, is Gabe at one point, he references the CW work shoot angle they ran on an earlier show. And Gabe says, quote, that angle accidentally made the tape. Like, yeah, it just made it <laughs> accidentally, including the part where Gabe yells into the into his mic. He goes, uh, Doug, edit this off. Edit this segment off of the home release. Don't show this. And he's like, oh, this. And later he'll make like an in-joke where he'll be talking about that angle again. And he'll say something to the effect of like, you know, Doug Gentry's commenting with him as Ray Morrow, and he's like, um, yeah, Doug Gentry, like, that guy didn't, screwed up and didn't edit it off the release, like, just, he's having a little fun with his friend at that point, like, shitting on Doug, even though Doug's right there behind, beside him as a different yeah. character. Right. But just this this goofy idea that they keep trying to still se- sell the CW shoot angle as a shoot that they just accidentally forgot to edit off of a DVD. Like, it's just so ridiculous. They're just really, um, really bad at their jobs is what they're trying to say. <laughs> well, I mean, they're getting the tapes out pretty late. So, actually, in a, in a way, Matt, really? maybe a little truth ringing in there. But Now, that's um, a top-level Trevor Dame burn. Gosh. Uh... God, I'm so stupid tonight. That's that Pepto getting to my brain, but that's not uh, what it's supposed to. That's not what we're supposed to get to. <laughs> oh God! Uh, did you, did you cre- take something different? <laughs> Pepto's like injectable, right? It's like a clear liquid <laughs> oh you boil. Uh, no, um, Credo finally ends this segment saying that his next member is Homicide's good friend Low Key. Side Homicide comes out. He gets on the. Oh, he was already out. I think he gets on the mic to refute that. Says, you know, no, he'll never join you. He attacks Carino, and then we're off to the races with the match itself. Homicide versus Steve Carino the first time, and Carino beats Homicide in 12 minutes 17 seconds when Homicide passes out in Carino's Cobra Sleeper. So as a match, like, it's funny, Carino and Homicide is considered this, you know, one of the legendary early Ring of Honor feuds. They're going to have a couple really well-received matches later in the year. As a match, before we get to what happens after the match, this is nothing special. It's perfectly fine. Um, 
I think it's also hard to get into because the folk, it's, this focus of this match is all over the place. Um, during the match, a bunch of people in the crowd start really catcalling Carino. Carino's entire group of C.W. Anderson, Samoa Joe, Simply Luscious, and Michael Shane are around the ring yelling at Homicide and the people in the crowd. Um, they're cutting to Gabe and them and C.W. You know, yelling at whoever. So basically, there's a ton of cutaways there's a ton of like talk that isn't about the match from the commentators. Your def- your attention is divided. The only good thing about that is it does get to a point where it feels like there's all this tension simmering in like eight directions because there's so many people around the ring in the crowd kind of being agitated at each other. But as a match, like this is not the match that people fondly remember about from Carino and uh, Homicide. It's very straightforward, and there is one weird moment I have with it, too, which is the turning point in this match is Homicide sets Carino in a chair on the outside, and he goes to his great, fantastic Tope Conhilo, and Carino gets out of the chair at the last second. Homicide crashes and burns th- into the chair, and from that point in the match, He sells like he's unconscious and dead weight most of the way. He doesn't get other than maybe like one punch to the gut. Another bit of offense in the rest of the match. Basically, Carino like drags him into the ring, does two or three moves on him, gets a couple near falls. And after a minute or two of that, he puts him away with the drag with the Cobra sleeper. And is like for homicide supposed to be the face in this feud. And at least as much of a face as you can be when you stab your opponent's eyeball in a skit. But like he, it was such a, it felt like there was a beat missing in this match because it felt so weird that like Carino didn't cheat to beat him. You know, it wasn't this epic back and forth match where Carino was just a little bit better. It's like homicide kind of beat himself. He made one huge mistake wiped out and then Carino spent like the next couple minutes basically like beating a corpse until he finally just couldn't respond. And it, it, I felt like it was kind of an anticlimactic way to end the first match of this feud that they've been building for months. Well, I can't quite agree with you that it's anticlimactic because the climax was what happened after the match. And that was certainly climactic, whether you thought it was good or not, it's a different story, but I guess, I guess that's the point that the whole match was like a backdrop for yeah, what's going to come after this. Right. The match was a backdrop for the angle. I think the reason that they had Carino beat homicide clean is because they had big ideas for Carino to be the top heel in the company. And homicide was not the top baby face in the company. You know, this angle was sort of like a stepping stone into the feud with the prophecy. That's how I saw it. And I think they, you know, homicide continued to grow on them and so, you know, they started pushing him more. I, I think that's pretty much the explanation for that. Um, but you're right, the match, there was nothing much. The one thing I will disagree with you on is the thing where they, where they made the crowd seem tense. Because, you know, like Gabe says a lot during the match, like, oh, this crowd is getting ugly. Oh, there's a lot of tension in the crowd. Oh, you can hear how ugly this crowd is getting. And I sort of, sort of, sort of felt like it rang false. Like you saw like a couple of the guys in the crowd – you know, like that were clearly plants jawing with the wrestlers and the wrestlers would jaw back. But the actual overall like crowd noise and the regular people that you saw during the rest of the show all seem to be sitting there just like they normally were for the rest of the show. You know, I mean, how much can you really fake something like that? Like ugly atmosphere in a crowd, you really can't. Um, So I guess they did the best they could, but I didn't really get the sense that there was an ugly atmosphere in the crowd. I I felt like the crowd was into the match and it felt like they were kind of excited about what was going on, but it didn't feel like they were really like, you know, I've seen shows that have ugly crowd reactions where like people are throwing stuff at the ring. There's a lot of booing, you know, there wasn't that during this. Yeah, I mean, I think there was tension. I felt like when I say it felt like tension, I feel like it was not just the tension from the crowd because I don't think, like you said, it's. It, it, from the crowd, there wasn't tension except from that group of obvious plants that are situated directly opposite the hard camera that the security makes no attempt to remove. But I was talking just more about like, you know, it keeps camera keeps cutting away to CW. People keep talking about the people in the crowd yelling, you know, camera cuts to Michael Shane yelling at the people in the crowd, like the, the plants, you know, um, at one point in the match, homicide spills to the outside and like Samoa Joe gets in his face and talks to him. And, yeah. and you know, all that, just like there's all these different tensions going on in the match, but in terms of like getting the actual crowd that was not 
plants. Like, no, you're, you're absolutely right. There wasn't tension from them. And as you told them, you were telling me earlier, um, I think yesterday on messenger, like, this is another one of those things where Gabe telegraphs it just so much, like way too much of like, Ooh, there's tension in the crowd. It's like getting ugly. Is, yeah. 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 Just like to the point where you're like, well, there seems like there's a pocket of six guys in the back who are being kind of jerks, but the rest of the crowd just seems to be taking this normal. And yeah, exactly. It's just about this geeky wrestling crowd. Like, Oh, I'm really sc- like, it's very hard to imagine going to an ROH show and, you know, thinking like there was any sort of actual riot going on, even in even in Queens in two thousand three. Maybe if there was like half price pizza slices or something, there'd be a riot. But other than that, <laughs> <laughs> get it? Because wrestling fans like to eat junk food. <laughs> Another burn for the compilation. But uh, I like pizza. <laughs> I like pizza too. So we finally get to the infamous Ring of Honor riot. The end, the match ends with uh, Homicide passing out in the Cobra Sleeper. After the match, uh, Creos group gets in the ring. They uh, attack <laughs> Homicide's uh, stylized 187 Yankee jersey who he wore to the ring. Creo puts um, Homicide back in the Cobra Sleeper. And that's when a bunch of these plants hit the ring. Just a, a few people start... R- running to the guardrail security tries to stop them, but they get over. We see in a later camera angle that at the same time that the security is like getting in with those people, a separate person runs from the other side of the building, other side of the ring gets into the ring and homicide immediately single leg takes him down in the ring. And for the next 10 minutes or so, it's just a bunch of these plants at ringside fighting with a, everyone that was involved in the match, other wrestlers come out to get involved in the riot and attack these fans or these fake fans. Um, the Christopher Street Connection, the Carnage crew, Low Key eventually comes out. Just a bunch of guys coming in. Uh, the Hit Squad come out, and they're. It's ten minutes of just video of people brawling at ringside, and Gabe is there. Rob Feinstein's there. Rob at one point like is screaming that, you know, we're not going to be allowed to be booked in this building again. Uh, Gabe is screaming. Like he lets out a couple of his infamous, like I've heard uh, Samoa Joe on, on a shoot interview say, you know, gave us this infamous, like girly frightening scream. And if you watch this segment, you will hear a couple of those where he's like, get to the fucking back. No, just like screaming and shrieking in a really scary way. Um, he's all around the ring at one point standing in the ring. Uh, the commentary goes on for a few minutes and is really again, annoying where they're like, you know, Oh, kayfabe's out the window here and stuff. But eventually they just stop even doing commentary. And they're then ring of honor liked this segment so much and it was a buzzworthy famous segment at the time they repeat the entire thing two more times in a row with the words roh exclusive written on the screen as if anyone else would have the exclusive rights to alternate camera angles of a ring of honor riot um also as if as if anything on the show wasn't an roh exclusive (laughs) exactly so we see two more camera uh, the other handheld camera angle and the uh hard cam angle we see the whole riot in full so at this point the whole segment takes up i don't know 25 30 minutes and this was really famous at the time um Mike Johnson from PWI PW Insider was there at the time. He claims a lot of fans believed it was real. Dave and the Observer wrote that a lot of fans' lives were fooled into thinking that this wasn't an angle. I can tell you for a fact it was an angle. I have watched a Steve Creel shoot interview where he and Gabe, who was interviewing him, talk about it being an angle. We can go into that a little more in a second. Also, one of the main guys involved was Julius Smokes. Yes, Julius Smokes. Mike Johnson even goes as far as to name all the people involved. They were all people from Homicide's wrestling school, the Long Island something, I think. It, he had uh, the Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, J-Train, who was Julius Smokes. Liathon or something like that. Low Life Louis Ramos, Cash, Chaos, Big, Diami, and Rekka. So just what? a bunch Liathon. of Liathon. What is this? A White House press briefing? It's spelled L A I T T H. Right, get it? Yeah. For, for for a second I thought you were saying like, don't you mean Leviathan? I was gonna defend myself, and then I realized you were making a joke about the nature of our body politic. Mm. So 
<laughs> but yeah, like, um, Matt, do you think if you were there live, you would have been fooled by this? I mean, I wouldn't have the classic commentary to tell me that there was tension in the crowd. Um, honestly, I, I, it's very hard to say. Uh, in two, like now, no. Um, in 2003, as a 19-year-old, uh, I guess I guess it's possible. Um, you know, I get scared very easily, as you probably know. Um, so I would probably be scared even if I knew it was a work, you know. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I, it, it, like, it didn't, I mean, being on tape, it didn't seem that real, you know, and it didn't seem that dangerous in the actual crowd. You know, all the real stuff happened, you know, on the wrestler side of the guardrail. And, uh, you know, there were just a couple big guys that Samoa Joe hit and they fell down and they pretty much just stayed down and they got up again and they got hit and they stayed down. It didn't seem like there was like a ton of actual danger. There were like 45 different wrestlers that came out. If you notice, there were still a bunch of wrestlers that didn't come out. You know, you didn't see Paul London, you didn't see Xavier, you didn't see AJ Styles. You know, there were still enough guys that were obviously like, okay, um, well, you know, this is real and, you know, our brothers are in danger, but, you know, we got a match later on. You know, we got <laughs> we got to put on a, a match of the year candidate. So, uh, you know, and CM Punk wasn't there. Probably still mad that Reckless Youth wasn't showing up. So, uh, it's just, <laughs> you know, there were just, there was enough things that would tell you, okay, this is not real. Um, but I think, you know, if it had just been shown once, I think that would have been a pretty cool segment. You know, it, it's definitely different. It, it you know, made the, the group seem dangerous and edgy. Um, it definitely went on for too long. There was no need to show it two times. And I, it probably is a stupid idea. Like, the stu- in the sense of, you had, you had even mentioned, if, if there were people in the crowd that believed it was real and were prone to irresponsible behavior, they could have started doing actual violent things to people. And that's a bad idea. You don't want to blur the line so much that actual people are put in actual danger. Yeah, th- that's something I was talking to Matt the other day about going back to the Steve Carino shoot interview where he t- – and it's an RF video shoot interview, so Gabe's conducting the interview. And they're talking about the angle, and like Steve liked how the angle came off, but he does mention like – you get you get the impression impression like he's being po- like diplomatic, but that he didn't think it was like a smart idea long term. Like both for the reason that if like he said, if fans get involved, how are you supposed to know in like this chaotic worked shoot angle? If a real fan decide to attack you, how would you know what was real and what wasn't at that point? You know, and likewise, just the idea that if you're creating like, is this going to hurt? Maybe you getting booked in a building again? If like it's one of these things where if if either you don't pull off the angle or if you pull off the angle really well and fool a lot of people, that could be dangerous too in a variety of ways. I know Dave and the Observer, when the Ring of Honor would go on to repeat this angle a couple times, which would not be as well received as this angle was. Historically, this is seen as like a cool, like unique thing. The fact that they immediately go back to the well two more times is seen as overdoing it, rightfully so, I th- I would say. But uh, something that I was going to say for a later episode, but Dave writes when I think they try the angle a second time, is that there's a danger in repeating this angle. And he says that what he pointed to was WCW at a time once ha- decided to, in a short time, do a lot of um, people running in from the crowd angles. And Dave claims that when WCW did that, more fan, real fans started doing the same thing. So his, his idea is if you keep doing these fake ride angles, eventually people are just going to start to feel like, oh, well, it's okay to beat up the wrestlers now. You know, that the more you do this, the more you're like just asking for a problem. It just feels hard to believe that these nerdy ROH crowds are going to do that. But, you know, I guess, you know, in these northeast cities, there are actual some tough-looking guys in the crowd sometimes. It's not just a bunch of nerds like us. So I, I guess it is possible that this that, that could have happened. And, and, like, the nature of riots is riots don't start with, you know, 5,000 people going, 
oh, you know, we're going to definitely riot tonight if the outcome of this football game doesn't turn out how we like. It's a f- group of, like, drunken people, and then if they're allowed to kind of get away with it for a little while, other people get caught up in the fervor. Well, it depends, so, on, it depends on the kind of riot we're talking about. Like, it's some, some, there are some riots that involve, like, court verdicts and stuff like that, and that's a little bit different. But, yes, I, I agree. R- riots over trivial matters do tend to be fueled by a couple of drunk idiots. Yeah, sport riots, and then that just spreads. Where there there are people that are genuine, genuinely passionate about things, and then there are other people that more just like, well, if people are fucking shit up. I also want to throw a rock through this department store window and grab a DVD player, and I, I feel like that's what you. Even though yes, wrestling fans are not a brave or um, particularly physical lot. In, I would I would generalize. I do I do kind of agree with that Dave and Carino point, which is you keep doing this, and eventually you someone that just wants to like be part of crazy chaos might start getting the courage to do that and feel like this is okay. So I I I, I think this angle at best should have been done once. I think watching back in 2017, it's marginally entertaining. It's it's fun as a novelty. The actual brawl itself isn't that great and my favorite part was after gabe screaming then you just see devito and he's just like holding in laughter yeah and he goes i love this shit or something like that yeah and you can see gabe like walk by and he just like deadpans to the camera like i love this shit yeah and and the other thing is again like you said the the two extra replaying it twice just was not necessary or if you were going to put it on on a replay why not save that for the end of the dvd i've seen other independent wrestling dvds where they have extra angles or replays but they save it for the end of the show in case you don't want to watch them that way you can just turn it off ring of honor here you would have to just keep fast forwarding or skip to the next match and i will say in terms of fooling fans stuff like this i think the the less you see of it the more believable it is. Like the least interesting camera angle was also the most believable. And that was the hard camera angle they showed of the riot, the last camera angle, because it's farther away. You can hear less. You can see less. Like if I just saw that camera angle, I would have been more inclined to believe this because the, it's almost like the less you see, the more your mind fills in the blanks. So you go, wow, maybe there, it is something crazy. But then if you're watching something like the first two angles are just, um, live handheld cams and they follow all the action everywhere yeah yeah you and you even you know you can see things that like there was a lot of moves where i go well that could be real and then you see another move and go well that obviously wasn't real and then if you you, you just see crz had a rule where it was like if you see it on tv it's fake and it's pretty much follows for dvds also if they will go out of their way to show you something on dvd it's fake and uh, again the complete like the powerlessness of the security team to stop them. Uh, Like you would like to think the security team will have been able to do a better job. So this was, again, I'm trying to give context to this angle. It was considered a historical angle. I think it doesn't age that great, but it's still interesting. Um, My favorite part was just hearing someone random off camera at one point scream. He has a hammer. He has a hammer. It's like someone must've grabbed like the timekeeper's hammer or something. And, I liked hearing someone yell about that. And Boy, that would have been a wrestling story for the ages. Some crazy fan just starts beating people with a hammer. <laughs> in the middle of a and, which anniversary show. <laughs> and um, this is to be the last time we see Steve Carino for quite a while, which is crazy because this is all building up to his – this show is building up in a lot of ways a lot of future Carino stuff. But yet part of that will be he's booked for zero one, one and then part of it is – Karina will get arrested and spend some time in jail, which is something we can get to in, into on a future episode. But I didn't even know his, about that. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. His side of the story, he goes into it in great depth on a, on a video shoot interview. He spends like the first half an hour of talking about it where basically he had an ex-girlfriend who accused him of forging checks and using her credit cards. And as he describes it, he's coming back from Japan, I think going to some back to America and they take him off the plane and they put him in a jail. Do not allow him a phone call. Do not tell him when he's going to get a court date. And for like two weeks, they just move him from jail to jail every few days and don't let him contact anybody. And then when he finally sees a judge, they're like, Oh, this woman's obviously crazy. And yeah, that took him out a long time too. That's 
Crazy, yeah. Because I was going to say, it is weird to book so much around this guy, and then he disappears for six months. But I guess that's a good reason. <laughs> if- I mean, it doesn't. I think they said he was supposed to come back in, I think, um, in June. So even that's kind of crazy. Like they were going to shoot this and then not have him back for four months because of zero one. Yeah, that's, but that, then that's, I, ba- that's bad booking. I think. I, I I think he was. I think I might be wrong the month, but I think he was booked for June, and then this like he gets jailed for a couple weeks and has to go through all of this stuff. Yeah, ends up coming back in August. Yeah. Yeah. So. Even even as planned, bad idea to shoot so much around Carino when he just can't be relied on, but it was made even worse by something that was out of their hands. Right. So going next to a, another, we get a promo. Christopher Daniels is the only major name, regular major name, not on competing on the show, but he does get to do a couple backstage promos. He does one here, obviously pre-recorded on an earlier Ring of Honor show with Alice in Danger, where he... Cuts the same thing he's been cutting a lot lately. He tells Carino that despite all Carino's claims that all his current actions are just business, he's taking it very personally. And for the millionth time, he dares Carino to cast the first stone and start a war between his group and the prophecy. Perfectly average promo. I mean, solid promo, but it's the same thing we've heard a lot. Yep. And next we get the Outcast Killers and Dunham Marcos. They're set to wrestle when Gary Michael Capetta jumps in the ring and says someone from Steve Carino's group has requested mic time. And Gary says when someone from that group requests something, they get it. Which, again, why? Why does C.W. Anderson get whatever he wants? I don't know. Um, Everyone acts like they're powerless to stop them. So C.W. gets on the mic. He taunts the crowd about for his involvement in the riot they just saw he you know says i just beat up a bunch of new yorkers in the riot oh and by the way there was an intermission between the riot and this so that's like one of the funny points actually the the riot ends with someone saying there will now be a short intermission and and everyone uh, everyone boos (laughs) so uh cw says all four guys in the ring don't deserve He's going to give them a chance to leave and keep their careers. They don't take it. They don't leave. CW beats them down four on one. And then he lays out a challenge for anyone in the back to wrestle him. Out comes Sion Punk, who gets on the mic. He says that the person he was going to wrestle what didn't show up. So he accepts. And then we get CM Punk taking on and defeating CW Anderson. CM Punk wins via pinfall in nine minutes, 42 seconds with a sunset flip counter to a uh, spine buster. So before Matt, I ask you your opinion, your thoughts on the match. We'll just note that this was originally supposed to be CM Punk versus reckless youth and CM uh, reckless youth, at least according to commentary, got into a car accident and had to be taken to the hospital. So that is why he didn't show up. Obviously, I don't think they knew that reason before they did shot this. Otherwise, I don't think they'd be so like um, sh- kind of shitty to Reckless Youth because yeah. Punk does that comment. And then I think on the Ring of Honor website, even they said like for reasons unknown, Reckless Youth didn't show up or something. But then on the post-produced commentary, they're like, well, Reckless Youth got into a car accident and he'd, he'll be back. And he would be back. He would get him. He would get to wrestle in Ring of Honor. So, but what do you think? I mean, not a long match, nine and a half minutes. Yeah, I um, I didn't think it was good. Um, you know, they try to have like a an old school mat match, but it feels sloppy and awkward. Um, you know, a lot of it is distracting because Gabe is on commentary talking shit about C W Anderson, and he's like, "Oh, I'm just so distracted, I can't call a C W Anderson match." And Doug, meanwhile, is sort of trying to keep the focus and Gabe keeps losing it. Um, bunch of shiny wizards. Uh, Punk gets gets two with a shiny wizard, goes for another, but Anderson cuts him off the super kick and then Punk reverses the spine buster into like almost like a sunset flip roll up and gets the pin, but Anderson's shoulders aren't really down, so even the ending is sloppy. I think it was, I mean, it was nine minutes, but it felt shorter, so I guess that's good, but it was just a, a short, sloppy match. Um... Yeah, I you know I don't think Punk was impressive. It also the crowd you know was chanting "boring," which is another thing that you don't really hear much in ROH. Um, and I wouldn't have chanted "boring," but it was kind of boring. I think. Um, yeah, I thought the whole presentation just wasn't very good at all. Yeah, I, I thought this was average at best. 
uh, I think if it was this quality for longer, I'd be harsher on it. But because it was fairly short, it was less offensive. But it did one of those things I really don't like in indie matches where the first half of the match has a lot of um, dueling limb work where they're both picking a limb and working on it. And then the second half of the match, they just go, okay, it's time for our typical indie near fall moves match. So we're going to just... Like like someone flipped the light switch, forget everything we did in the first half, never go back to it for the most part. I'll just say to be fair, that's I feel like that's most matches, period, not just India. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, it is. For some reason, it bugged me in this match more. I don't know why. Another thing, like Matt pointed out, the commentary is horrible for this one. Like Matt said, Gabe even admits, like, I'm not doing a good job calling this because he just keeps ranting to advance the C.W. Anderson work shoot angle. Like, uh, you know, I can't believe he's here. He shouldn't be here. He disrespected the blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, Punk is the guy that they're about to give this giant rocket to, and he's basically an afterthought in the match. It's They almost protect C.W. Anderson, too, because, like, when Punk wins with that sloppy roll-up, it's and his shoulders don't look all the way down. Gabe goes immediately after the pit. He goes a controversial finish, and it's like, why are you protecting C.W. Anderson when, like, like that, like you just said, Punk starting with the next show is going to get the big Raven feud, and like, I, I just say he won. <laughs> you know, don't go oh a controversial finish. It's not like this is going to be a start a wide ranging C.W. versus C.M. battle of the initials match like feud it's nothing like that yeah they had like a big like m that they like they try to like sw- like reverse like they're fighting over it like which is it flipped up or is it flipped down <laughs> it- it's on a wheel it's the ultimate spin the wheel make it the deal match it's like they just it's a m and they spin it and if it lands upwards to w cw gets to choose the step otherwise if it's science and an m it's cm punk gets to make the step that's right but uh that was horrible <laughs> I would, uh, I would like to see that that match. I don't know. <laughs> the other thing that bugged me about this was, so in the beatdown CW does of the Outcast Killers and Ring Crew Express, he grabs the guy's arm and kind of torques it in a direction, and Gabe puts it over hard like, that's a new submission CW's come up with. It's called the Anderson Submission. And it's like, first, what a catchy name. But uh, second, then in the punk match, in the middle of the match, CW does the submission, and no one on commentary reacts to it like it's a big thing. They don't point out how that's his new finisher. Um, Punk doesn't act like he's in like grave danger. It's just a standard middle of the match move. Yet minutes earlier, when he did it to like a member of the Outcast Killers or Ring Crew Express, Gabe's like telling us it's his new submission, and they're acting like it's death. So I thought that was weird. Like within the space of five minutes, they forgot what his new finisher was and ceased to like give a shit about it. It's crazy. I guess my biggest impression, apart from this just being a bland average match and the few couple boring chants it got, is like it's crazy on this rewatch how Punk really didn't get off the ground until the Raven feud. Like he was really going nowhere. I mean, the Colt matches were solidly good and the Michael Shane matches weren't horrible, but. Like, Punk being a rah-rah, like, this company is great, babyface wasn't a good fit for his promos, his matches weren't incredible, his performances in them weren't great. Like, if you just stopped Punk right here, it, it would have he would have felt like one of 20 project wrestlers Gabe pushed over the years that never really took. But there is a possibility that this was all on purpose. That's some pretty next level stuff if the plan was for Punk to not look great for five or six shows well, and just then seem bland and white meat. And yeah. then just come out as this like edgy character all of a sudden. I, I, I could see the logic in that. They sort of did the same thing with Xavier. I mean Punk just performed at an, another level, obviously. Um but you know, CM Punk at this point, it's not like his he was known for his ring work. He was known for his character work, and he wasn't allowed to be the character. And I don't think that Gabe was so stupid where he didn't realize that, you know? Yeah, you're right. I think another I think another thing about that, too, is, though, I just think, like, Punk has always been a very divisive person, not just because of his personality, but even back in his heyday on the indies, people were like, I love Punk, and other people were like, oh, he's the most overrated guy out there. And I feel like this stretch is a good example of why people might feel that way where, you know, punk was having these great, like 
feud with Chris Hero and IWA Mid South. I don't know how much how well all that ages, but it was really well received at the time. And it's I feel like Punk was a guy where depending on what you saw of him, you could have vastly different impressions of him. Like if you just watched if, if I told you at this period, you got to check out the CM Punk, and you said, well, I'm watching Ring of Honor, so I'll check out like his first few Ring of Honor matches. I could completely understand if someone was like, I don't get the big deal. I, I remember Mike Johnson at the time d- wrote a review of one of the early Colt and Punk matches, and I think Mike Johnson said something like, I don't get what the hype is with these guys. And I, I could, even though I thought those matches were solid, like... I can understand, you know, in certain contexts, if you don't see the promos and the character and Punk at his best as a wrestler, I can see if you saw him on the wrong night or the wrong month, why you would go, I don't get it. Like, why does anyone see anything special in this guy? I agree, but then they sort of are like, okay, here's why. Exactly. Like, we're going to, and, and that's the flip side, which is if you see him in the right context, you go, this is one of the biggest talents on the indies. Right, and you're going to see that very soon. So, I do think that there's like a we're going to lull you in so you don't even realize what you're about to get sort of situation. I really do think there was. I mean, I don't know that he wasn't supposed to be more impressive in the ring, but I do think that people were supposed like there was this idea that you weren't supposed to expect what you were about to get with him. And I mean, even just for what he's booked here, like they even before the CW thing, he was originally booked for Reckless Youth. Obviously, he's just kind of in a holding pattern until the Raven thing kicks off. Right. You know, they're, they're, so in that in the booking sense, yeah, they're they're not. It's not like he's wrapping up one hot angle before he starts the Raven angle. It's like, well, Raven's coming on the next show, so let's just try and get you a match, and then you're really going to get your push starting soon. Right. Exactly. But next we have a rematch from the very last show: Samoa Joe taking on Brian Danielson. And Brian Danielson beats Samoa Joe via pinfall in 15 minutes, 21 seconds, with a small package. This match was very similar, I found, to the match on the last show, Revenge on the Prophecy. I thought it was very similar in quality. I felt like while it wasn't move for move the same, it had a lot of the same elements where they're both very intense with each other, both very stiff with the full force slaps to the face, Um, a good mix of like ring work like in like mat work and uh moves the thing that kind of um is different about this match is at some point it felt like danielson started wrestling more like an underdog than he had in the first match or even the first part of this match there's a part where you know joe really starts seeing like he's taking a bit more control of the match and it feels less like 50 50 and more like danielson's trying to find his openings to win even the end where he just gets a uh a small package against the flow of the match. Like that even is kind of a skin of your teeth type win, you know, which I guess is a sign of maybe them seeing big things for Samoa Joe and wanting him to look strong, even in losing. But there's not, it's weird. Like when I was writing my notes for this match, I even wrote, I feel like I should be saying more about this match than I have to say, but there's not much to say about except like, these are two guys that have obvious chemistry. It wasn't an incredible match. It was another like good to very good, like straightforward match. Um, I think these are two guys that couldn't have a bad match against each other if they tried. I think they just go g- well together. Um, the the one really memorable moment for me is Joe has that regular signature move where he's in a corner, his opponent takes a running charge at him, and th- Joe grabs the guy in like a urinagi, like rock bottom type slam and just slams him from the corner down to the mat. And I don't think Joe's ever done it better than he's done it here. He holds Brian for like one extra split second and just lands like Danielson lands with like a big thud and the crowd chants, holy shit for something that would become like just a regular signature Joe spot. But it's done so well here and the crowd probably hasn't seen it so much that like it's a highlight spot. And Again, this match is just, it feels like they could do this match at will, which is crazy for a match that has so much hard slapping and stuff, but just a good, satisfying match. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. Um, you know, definitely, I think that the big differentiation between, the big difference between this match and the previous one is that Joe dominated more for a lot of, for a lot of it, which wasn't really the case in the first match. Um, in general, I, 
you know, yeah, I agree that the execution is just what makes these guys stand out. Because I, I, I also agree that they, there's not a lot to say about the match as far as like a story. You know, Joe's dominating, Dra- Dragon's trying to find his opening, but all the moves are just done so well. Um, not just the one that you mentioned, but all of Joe's like super bendy Boston crabs. There's a spot right at the beginning where Danielson does like a neck bridge and Joe tries to put him down like by jumping on his legs. And, you know, Danielson stays up, which is, I mean, that's really impressive because Joe is a big guy. <laughs> um, like that's just legitimately super impressive. Joe just brutalizes De- Dragon with the kicks and the knees, does the power bomb into the submissions. You know, they, they, they don't get, I don't think it gets quite as intense down the stretch. Like, there was that spot in the last match where Joe starts screaming and Dragon starts screaming back. It doesn't quite get up to that level. Um, it's just more like Dragon is trying to fight from underneath. But, yeah, it's really the execution. And it's like, you, you really see, like, these two guys have such a more dramatic match in them. You know, they never quite do the dramatic finish in either of these first two matches. You know, and it's kind of a bummer that you know, over the next few years, they don't really get to wrestle each other that much. They have one real climactic match in 2004, which hopefully we'll get to, you know, pretty soon-ish, because um, <laughs> that's one of my one of my all-time favorite matches. But you definitely see their chemistry here, and it's really great. It's great to watch. It's just, it's really simple. You know, it's almost like a spot fest, but the spots are all just like hard-hitting strikes and submissions, not big, you know, fancy moves, and they do them so well that it really just seems like a fight. And, you know, that's what you want from these guys. I mean, going to what you said before, what makes it, like, maybe... It, it feels more good for you than other spot fests, if you're going to describe... For people who describe it as that, because, like you said before, just their polish on every move is so much... Like, it's a pleasure to watch these guys do anything. Like, even simple things, you're just like, wow, that's so well done. That's, like, just such a level above how anyone else in the in the promotion would do it in terms of smoothness, other than maybe a handful of guys, if that. Um, I uh, There was also a moment I loved where Danielson basically combines his cattle mutilation with an Indian deathlock. He's doing an Indian deathlock, and then he does the double underhooks of the arms. And I think I might have seen him do it once or twice around this time. But it's one of those classic examples of something Brian Danielson would count with like a cool, unique thing, and he'd do it a couple times, and then just be like, "Oh, I'm bored with this. I'll, I'll never do it again." Yeah, like like the airplane spin, where he would do that for a few months, and then be like, "Okay, like this is super over, but whatever. I had my fun with it." Like he's just so inventive and just constantly like. I know he has said before, like why he always changed his hair and his beard and stuff when he was on the indies, is he was like, I get bored easily. And I think he was the same way with his moves and, and his style. He was like, well, what's something cool I could do? Okay, I'll do this for a few shows. And now I'm tired of it. Yeah, I'm always surprised that he never really tried to get the cattle mutilation over in the WWE because I think it would have gotten over. He only did it a couple times there that I can remember. Um, but he just, yeah, he just wanted to move on. Yeah, and it's such a cool-looking, like, different-looking submission. And it's not – hasn't been done to death. It's not like – a hundred people trying to bring back the cross face post Benoit. Yeah. Like yeah, I'm, I'm supp- is a lot harder to do. It is. You have to have more of a bridge ability and it does look different. I wouldn't be surprised if that sign that's like Vince McMahon's like, what the heck is this thing? Cattle yeah. mutilation. Ugh. Like, but I mean, I, I don't know, but it, it's a move ripe, ripe to be stolen. At least while Danielson's still out, you have like one year to steal it. Do it while you can. And, Wait, it really uh, feels like forever waiting for him to get to become that free agent, huh? Yeah. Waiting for him to do our uh, podcast, Danielson. I mean, Danielson did a freaking hockey podcast this week and did the one chip challenge. Like, Danielson, if you can do that, please, please do our show. I know you're not listening. I'm just sending it out to the cosmic void. He might be, a DV, he might be a DV thrombozo. Maybe. I mean, th- our numbers are growing right. by leaps and dozens uh, so it's at least one new listener every year <laughs> no are we uh, I, you know what we like to joke our numbers are very are, i'm very happy with the number of listeners we have so i'll just say that i'll be the one time i won't be modest we do Aww. just fine and we will crush all interlopers but our next match, actually before the match, we get Allison Danger is out, and she introduces Xavier, and 
Xavier comes out in the ring to do a little mic work before his match. The fans really hate Xavier. They chant AC Slater as usual. But Xavier comes back and says that the AC stands for all champion. So, boom, Xavier finally has to come back to that. It took him about a year to get that. (laughs) It took him a long time. But he got it. Yeah. Um, Xavier says he wants to watch the number one contenders three-way, but correctly points out that he's already beaten all three wrestlers in the number one contenders three-way. Um, it was interesting when he was talking about the three guys, the guy whose name got the biggest pop was Paul London, even above low key and AJ styles, which I guess shows you how hot London was getting and how far he's come in a short time up to this point. And Somehow, we it, get the, it doesn't seem like the promotion would have been surprised by that based on the booking, but yeah. Yeah, they're, they're definitely going with him to a degree at this point, as we will see here with the Ring of Honor number one contendership three-way match. There's no mention of the number one tr- contender's trophy anymore, at least for here. Um, Paul London versus AJ Styles versus Low Key. Paul London wins in 18 minutes, 50 seconds, when he pins AJ Styles after hitting a shooting star press. How the finish goes, if we go into a little more detail, is... Loki hits a big giant second rope key crusher on AJ Styles, but Loki is too hurt and exhausted from the landing to cover him. So Paul London is in, able to instantly then do his shooting star press on the already hurt Styles, gets the pin. He can't break it up. He is the number one contender. Um, Matt, what did you think about this three way that seemed to be kind of trying to live up to the Era of Honor Begins three way? Well, it didn't live up to that one, but. It was. I thought it was really cool in its own way. Um, I thought there were some pacing issues, you know, down the stretch where it kind of got a little bit. Um, I don't know. Like maybe there were some pauses that were maybe not intended later on in the in the matches. Guys got tired, and they sort of front loaded it with a lot of cool stuff. But I think overall it was really innovative, really exciting. There was a lot of really cool things that they did um, very early in the match. AJ goes for a like a drop kick, like a basement drop kick on London. London moves. AJ lands on the bottom rope, and the bottom rope breaks, like right at the beginning of the match. Um, fortunately, the bottom rope breaking is not that big of a deal because the other ropes are not, you know, connected to it. So you could still do everything you want to do. But it was, it actually was kind of cool. Like it just showed like the intensity of what they were doing. They do a lot of cool stuff on the outside. Like AJ and Loki have this like brutal chop fest on the floor, and Loki takes him out with a capo kick on the floor. Just, you know, the stiffness is there. London then does dive onto everybody. Loki continues with the loud, brutal strikes. London's missile drop kicks are really, like, hard-hitting, so he steps up his strikes game. Um, you know, a lot of reversals. Some really cool submission stuff, like, so, age, so, like, AJ has London in, like, a mood lock. Then he pulls London up, so, like, they're both, like, their legs are still locked, but they're both, like, their torsos are upright. Loki kicks London in the chest, which makes London kind of keel over, but he's still locked in with AJ's legs. So Loki comes up behind AJ, hits, puts on the dragon sleeper. Meanwhile, London sits back up. Loki is like between him and AJ, and Loki and London grabs Loki's neck, and they're all like in this submission. The crowd loves that, and that was just a really cool, innovative spot. Um, just, just all kinds of stuff. Um, Looking through my notes just to see because I know, I know there's I've wrote, wrote a lot of it down. Um, yeah, so uh, Key hits a crush rush on AJ, then goes for one on London, but London reverses into a DDT. All three are down. Then AJ wildly knocks London off the top rope. London fights back up with headbutts, so another one of your favorite spots where they're fighting on the top rope. Um, AJ has Key in the Styles class position on the top rope, um, but. So Key like reverses into a top row Hurricane Rana, which London catches um, AJ and hits a power bomb. So that, that was like super contrived, but the crowd loved it. Um, then another capo kick on London in the corner. Uh, AJ does like his suplex combo on London, but Loki grabs a dragon clutch and London. Oh, excuse me, he does a suplex cl- combo on Loki, but he grabs a gra- dragon clutch. London breaks it up. And this is like when they start to lose their momentum. But London goes for a top rope reverse DDT on AJ. But but uh, then uh, Loki hits the tidal wave kick on London. So London's on the top rope. Um, then Key hits like a back kick to AJ for two. 
He goes for a top row key crusher, but London fights it off. Then AJ comes comes up, and all three guys are fighting on the top rope, so it's a three-person top rope struggle. Then Key hits the top rope Key Crusher on AJ. London's still on the top rope, so he quickly hits the Shooting Star Press on AJ. He gets the win. So again, like I thought the pacing wasn't as good as the last one. It's not some all-time classic, but as far as like moves and, and innovation of the big spots, I could see this match happening now and people still being blown away by a lot of the stuff that they do in it. Like like the the art of high flying in like a main event style match with strikes and stuff. I do not think it's advanced so much beyond what they were doing in this match here. No, that, that is something I actually wrote in my notes. I, I wrote like there's scramble matches. I we've watched on this, um, doing the podcast that I think would get over, but they feel a little like not quite at the level, like of the state of the art that now would be, but I feel like you could take this match flaws with the pacing and all and put it in a PWG right now. And Dave Meltzer would give it like four and three quarters or something. Yeah, uh, he would. Uh, it's like the, the, the stuff feels innovative and it's 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. There's stuff here. You won't, you still won't see today. You, you wouldn't have to change a move. Like it would fit right in with progress or, or PWG or anywhere like that. And that's the really impressive thing. Like this is a complete, just cool spot fest. Um, the difference between this and the era of honor begins three way is I felt like that one wasn't the one that largely avoided some of the tropes I hate with three ways, like where the, where one guy is just selling like death forever and ever. So the other two can wrestle or like having too many really convoluted three way spots. This match has both of those, but I feel like ever, there's so much innovation and so much cool stuff that it just didn't matter. I thought like this, I thought this was great. For what it was, for I just, will, like, and, I, and I'll add one thing: the, this has over the other one. It has Paul London, who has that emotional pull on the crowd that I don't think anybody in that first match had. Um, you know, you really rooting for Paul London. You know, he wasn't quite you know like the underdog in this match the way he was in well, the next match, but he still kind of played that role, and he was like the hero of the match, even though it was all three were baby faces. And I think that does add an element to the match that was missing in the first one. Yeah, and that first match was like, here are the three big names in indie wrestling on like the early 2000s indie Mount Rushmore, even then, like showing how to do it. And this match is like, here's the young, hot up and comer with two of the biggest indie names that are established. And so there's that thing of you're rooting for the underdog, there's they're fighting for something this time, you know, a number one contender title shot. You know, people aren't just here. Like one thing Paul Lund's bringing to some of these recent matches with Xavier and with this is that, unlike so many indie matches, people aren't just rooting for a good match. They want to see a very specific result. They want Paul London to win. They want Paul London to beat the guy they don't like. They want Paul London to win the title, etc. Like they want to see a very specific thing happen, and that gives a completely different energy to how the crowd reacts in these matches. Um. Just so so many innovative spots where even though it has some of the flaws of three ways and has the problems where I feel like they like Matt is completely right where they shoot their wad and it looks like they get kind of tired and a bit more spaced out later. Just everything they do in this match is either innovative or crazy or just novel or just a big standard spot they normally do. Like there's no a lot of times when you see three ways, I feel like there's a few really cool moments and then the rest of the match is three guys like figuring out how to fill time before they get to the next pre-planned cool spot. Punching, this each, feels other, like, punching each other in the corner. Yeah, yeah th- this match feels like they came up with nothing but cool spots. It's like just, it, it's nothing but the cool highlights from other ones of those matches. And do they run out of, do they get tired? Yes. You know, does it get disjointed a little bit? Yes, but... It's just, I guess, as the, you know, the great Canadian pop punk band Sum Forty One would say, Matt, all killer, no filler, and uh, uh, yeah, that's exactly I what mean, Sum Forty One would say. Or it would probably be more like their other album, All Killer, No Filler, some lying around catching our breath. But um, I actually punk- think that in some ways, AJ was the most impressive in the match, um, just in terms of physicality. He's he really does impress me. Like the, when I go back and watch him, he was he was amazing, and I don't think he, I don't think he was I don't think he was fully appreciated in some corners until until it was unfairly late. 
yeah, like I think that's something we learned early on in this rewatch is he's so much more like like you said physicality he's so much more snug and kind of tight as a wrestler like i think people will just think of early age styles as the young high flyer and it's like no he he could throw a, a good hard shot to the head like with anybody he was a pretty and, complete wrestler the only thing that yeah. was really missing was the character and his moves had a real snap to them not just like a light contact yeah well, the one thing he could have learned is he looks so fucking dorky in this match when he comes to the ring wearing a x file styled shirt that says the x styles and he's wearing a hair- headband too it's like the geekiest aj styles maybe has ever looked in his life but other than that aj styles great performance here great performance by everybody uh paul london there's just matt named off so many highlights and it says something about this match where i could probably name off even more like paul london does a frog splash to the floor on two standing opponents uh there's a point where paul london is caught in a aj style stretch where his he's like on his knees and his head being pulled back and so his whole chest is exposed and low key just kicks him super hard in the chest three times when he really can't defend himself and just so many cool spots crowd after this match chance match of the year. I mean, I don't know if I would go that far. It's a great, in my opinion, if you like just crazy spot fest matches, it's great. If in, you, uh, it, in early, in, in early February of 2003, it's obviously among the best matches of the year. I mean, we'd already seen Ben versus angle, which I think was the American match of the year <laughs> that year. But this, yeah, I mean, this was, you know, a great match. It could, I could easily understand why someone would say that. I mean, I can understand, like, the intention of the crowd to chant match of the year. It just It's a way of saying we think this match is great. But there is something pretty hilarious about chant, chanting match of the year for a match that happened on February 8th. Yeah. Like, I also, it's, been one, it's been five weeks. I also find it hilarious, I might have mentioned this already, when Gabe is like, oh, you know, people can say match of the year, but when you have a live crowd chanting it, then you know it's a match of the year. And it's like, no, I mean, I think that would be, like, the most biased judgment possible is the people that were there live and want to say they were there for the match of the year. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Just, I would really like to see though people. It's weird. Like, I don't know. I think our audience gets a few different kinds of people, people who like to revisit ring of honor and they watched it. I saw a few people that were re watching it for the first time along with us. We're not watching it for the first time, but they were using our podcast as an excuse to go back and discover it. I'd be interested in seeing what people thought, who like are really into modern indies but did not watch this era. Like I'd be interested if you're a person that watches PWG every few months. What do you do how do you think? Do you think we're right when we say this match like could fit right in there? Because I think it could. So I, I if anyone feels that way, like definitely go out of your way. If that's the kind of wrestling you like, check this out. Yeah, yeah, it's, I think it's worth saying. If you've never seen this match before, do you find it impressive? because uh, I, I, I can't imagine how you don't. Yeah, I, 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 again, I think you, again, I just want to emphasize, I don't think you would have to change a move and it would fit, it would be something that a Dave Meltzer sitting next to a sleeping Ron Jeremy would lose his shit over at a PWG show. Like he, he would love it, I think. So AJ, after the AJ match, though might not perform for Ron Jeremy. I don't know. <laughs> after the match, the crowd chants, like I said, match of the year, London raises styles and keys hands in a nice little moment. Um, both men tell London that he better go beat Xavier. Xavier gets in the ring and he tells Paul London that the only way he'll get a title shot is if he wrestles him right now. So one thing I want to point out that we haven't mentioned yet, which I think is really weird. I mean, it's, I know why they did it, but it comes off as kind of awkward, which is the whole conceit of this match is whoever wins this three way gets a title shot against Xavier tonight. So the thing that's weird about that is, Gabe during this tries to sell like, oh, it's not fair that Xavier's forcing him to do this because otherwise he would have gotten to wrestle during the gotten to rest during the scramble match. But it's like if Ring of Honor was so concerned about the winner of this match getting rest, why didn't they schedule this match for the opener of the show? Or like, before intermission at least. I- yeah. Exactly. Like yeah. like how weird is it? Like, all right, we're gonna have a number one contenders match. And a title match. So where do we put them on the card? We're going to have the number one contenders match be the third last match on the show. And then the title match be the last match on the show. That's never been done in wrestling. I, don't, I can't recall. Th- that's only done so that they can do this angle. Yeah. Like because- there, there have been a lot of times um, 
where there will be second to last matches that are short. So how do they know that that scramble match wouldn't have been like two minutes long? Hmm? <laughs> exactly. It's just one of those things where they want to have the story of Paul London was unfairly not allowed to be given rest and he was bullied into this, which gives him a bit of an out. But at the same time, like it just makes no logic why you would book it book it like this if you were that concerned about a fair fight. I think in the, sp- in the pantheon of wrestling illogical booking, I think I can accept this one for whatever drama they're trying to uh, get out of it. Yeah, it, it's not offensive as much as it's just like, Stupid. like you, yeah. yeah, they're trying to build drama and out of something that is set up to not build much trauma. Yeah. Like, ooh, instead of getting a three out, like, he, like Xavier deprived him of a 20 minute break. Oh my God, he's evil. Mm-hmm. But, we get the next match, though. Um, Allison Danger jumps in the ring and distracts London, allowing for Xavier to sneak attack him. The bell rings, and we get the Ring of Honor title match, the rematch. Xavier with Allison Danger taking on Paul London. Xavier wins this match in 19 minutes, 33 seconds, with a roll-up with a big old hand to tights. Um, I thought this was great, too. I, I think Paul London and Xavier have really good chemistry together. I think there's a special factor in the way their careers sync up in these matches where people really don't want to see Xavier's champion. They really love booing him. They love Paul London. They want him to see, be champion. So it's you get these crowd where they're, they're really like, again, they're not cheering for a match. They're cheering for results, which is always makes, in my opinion, for a hotter crowd. There, there's points early in this match where it felt like the crowd was a little burnt out move to move from the last crazy match, but yet they were still always very loud for Paul London and chanting for him and hoping that he wins where it was like, even if they were burnt uh, out for a little bit wrestling wise, they weren't burnt out for wanting to see Paul London win a, win a big important wrestling match. They still were really up for that. And this is a much, this is a more underdog Paul London match. He, um, he sells the beating pretty well early on from the earlier match. I think some people who watch this who are sticklers for detail will get a bit mad by how energized Paul London gets in the second half of the match. I will say Gabe tries to sell it as London's getting his second wind. And I think they did enough for me to kind of buy into that because early in the match, Paul London does a drop salt and he can't even rotate on it, so he just lands on his back. And then later in the match when he's firing up, he hits two straight drop salts in a row, rotates for both of them, and I think that's when Gabe makes the comment maybe around there. So it did kind of come off as, like, yeah, Paul London was hurt from the last match, but you know what? His adrenaline's flowing, he's getting that second wind, you know, he's ready to fight back. And Paul London is just a fucking maniac, excuse my language, I know all the kids listen to the show, but excuse my language, but he is a freaking maniac in this match. He takes a, what I would call a Whitman sampler of kinds of abuse in this match. He gets German suplexed right on his head. He gets back dropped over the ropes into the hard timekeeper's table. Then later he gets whipped into the railing, but catches the end of the table, which just sounded horrible. He gets laundered into a ring post and blades. He dives to the floor and uh, crashes into Alice in danger in a really scary manner. That looked like they could have both been hurt. He, um, flies from the top to the floor again. He moonsaults off the guardrail. Like, just the fact that Paul London just wrestled a very physically intensive nearly 20-minute match and then does all of this in another nearly 20-minute match, like, just one of the craziest one-night performances I've seen in indie wrestling. I think in these two matches, you see both parts of what makes Paul London amazing, which is he's this great athletic daredevil, but he's also one of the greatest underdogs of his era in terms of he knows how to take a beating. He knows how to do a good comeback. He has like the, just the youthful, handsome, like boy next door looks that makes people more inclined to cheer for him. And like Xavier holds up his end of this match. I feel like it's some of the most overt Xavier cheating we've seen yet with like the kick to the groin and show him with tape early on and stuff like that. But really, I felt like this, maybe I'm being unfair to Xavier, I felt like this was the Paul London show, and 
I, I thought this was a great match. And some of the pops for those near falls near the end, when Paul London was hitting like the shooting star press and got a big near fall and things like that, the crowd just goes just so nuts. They just so badly wanted to see Paul London win here. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. Um, I, you know, and it's interesting because this is kind of what I was getting at earlier about like throwing back to ECW when this is like an early example of something that you see Gabe doing a lot, which is you make the crowd really want something and you really, really, really hold off on giving it and you possibly never give it. Like it's, it makes me wonder like what, how things would have been different if they had just ended the show with London triumphantly with the title. Um, you know, and I guess looking back, it's probably like there was no upside to that. You know, even if London wasn't leaving, because once you have the big underdog win the title, he's not the underdog anymore. And that takes something away from him, I think. But it is like, it is Heyman booking, where it's like, you know, with Jerry Lynn and Rob Van Dam, and then, you know, Rob Van Dam winning the title, and, you know, just a lot of different stuff where it's like, you, you, wanna, you want this guy to finally overcome, and he never overcomes. And by the time he overcomes, it really might not even matter anymore. And they did it with Samoa Joe also, you know, where they were building to CM Punk winning the title, and then he never did, and then you surprise it with Austin Aries. And this time, you know, someone else who they're not building up beats Xavier. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting booking philosophy of just, like, literally withholding the gratification pretty much forever and then just kind of subverting the expectation. Gabe does it even later on with Tyler Black, too, um, years later. So it's, it's and, a, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to, and some argue with Nigel McGuinness that he did the same, that he held off for too long. Like, a, one of the people's common complaints with Gabe is that he, uh, was late pulling the trigger on a lot of people winning titles. Like wait, he waited too long and it kind of missed the moment. And even though the Samoa Joe title ring obviously turned out like insanely great and Paul Lennon wouldn't be long for W for uh, independent, independent wrestling. He'd be going to WWE. I mean, you could argue this is the first instance of Gabe as a booker, not seizing on a moment where the crowd was clearly ready to just lose their minds for something. Well, that's like, why I say like this pet. is this is really him learning the Heyman lesson, because Heyman did this, right? You know, Heyman. You know, there were a lot of times when you thought that someone was going to win something and they didn't, right? Yeah. Um, you know, um, the the big ones, you know, or the Jerry Lynn ones. I think that's those are the ones that I think of the most. But there, I'm sure there are others um, during that time. And um, you know, like I said, I get you know because I think back to when Homicide won. You know, that was the time when they really did you know build up the big victory and they gave it to him. And then there was nothing to do from there after he won. And maybe that would have been the same thing with London. Although in ROH, when Gabe was there, they never really tried the long-term, like, full-on babyface title reign. The closest they came was, I guess, the second half of Samoa Joe's title reign when he finally became, I guess, a pretty, pretty much a full-on babyface. You know, he was sort of, like, playing the kind of tweener role for a while, right, in 2003, as we'll, mm-hmm. which we'll see. Um, but otherwise, you know, it really was kind of a heel territory where, like, the long-term champion was mostly a heel. Um, but I guess it could have been different. You know, I mean, Loki, they obviously didn't feel comfortable with Loki being the champion either. You know, it might just be a thing where Gabe just feels more comfortable with his champion being a heel and being chased. Well, there's also um, something that I think we talked about in an earlier episode where Dave wrote about this fairly early on with Ring of Honor, which was that this is something he disagreed with, that Gabe's philosophy was guys like Low Key and Daniels and Danielson didn't need the title because they were so over. And that so he was more inclined to give the title to guys like Xavier, who he felt like needed an extra something to give them get them over the hump, except Dave's point, I would agree, would be the title doesn't mean anything if you don't give it to important guys too. A lot of the time that, that the crowd are like the favorites of the crowd. And part of me wonders, maybe that was in Gabe's mind too, which is like, you know what? Paul London's so over now. He doesn't need the title. You know, Samoa Joe does. Yeah. Well, in, in the case of Joe, it was a gamble that paid off. I mean, honestly, with Xavier too, it's not like Xavier didn't benefit from being the champion. It's just, did he benefit enough to make it worth him being the champion for that long? I mean, I guess this match would be the one moment where you're like, okay, this is the culmination of his title reign. Like the fact that we got to this moment where everybody hated him, everybody loved Paul London, everybody was dying for Paul London to beat him. He still won with a, with a fluky roll-up, um, so it was the same as all the other matches. But getting there was, you know, the emotion of this match was unlike anything that ROH had ever done. And in a way, it's sort of like ROH came of age. Um, this was the mat- This was the moment where, like, they were like, "Okay, people are really emotionally invested in an outcome and who holds the title." 
And, you know, it took a while for them to get to that point. You know, the only other time where you could really say it was possible was in that other London match in Final Battle. But really, this was the first match where that emotion was really part of it. Um, so, you know, it kind of became a fully realized wrestling promotion in this match, which is sort of an unsung match in ROH history. So that was really cool. The other thing is uh, Alexis, Lurie, Alexis Lurie came in, and it was kind of cool, actually, even though it was just, you know, you know, dumb novelty booking of women. It was cool that they kind of tied in. You know, Alexis Lurie had issues with the prophecy. Alexis Lurie, because of AJ. Alexis Lurie had issues with Alice in Danger because of her feud with her, and they kind of brought it all together in this match. So that added another layer also. Um, still, though, Alexis Lurie, they, didn't give you, they don't give you any reason to be impressed with her. Um, which is kind of interesting, but um, I thought it was overall a very good production, a very good presentation for ROH, something that you don't really see from them much at this point. Yeah, I forgot to, that's great uh, looking out, that's, uh, I completely forgot to bring up, Alexis Lurie comes out during this match, I would say that's one of the, for me, the big flaws of the match would be early on, Alexis Lurie comes to ringside, and and it does play great, as Matt said, into the history of the character and, you know, backing up Paul London and going after the prophecy again. But the thing that bugged me was there is more 14 for 14 man-on-woman violence here uh, with Paul London crashing into Alice in Danger in this match. Well, well, hold on. So I think you could make the case that this one doesn't count because it was, quote, an accident. But they make up for it pretty soon. Yeah. Well, I have a backup choice coming up in yes. one match. Then. Yes. But um, the one big flaw was, I, I think, out, late in the match, it's like after some big near falls, like it's very late in the match, Alice in Danger, like, first off, Alice in Danger is interfering in this match in full view of the referee and no one gives a shit. Like the, oh, yeah. The one, announcers thing, don't, one thing I want to mention earlier, Homicide hit Steve Carino with a chair a couple matches after the Carnage crew get DQ'd for hitting with a uh, with hubcaps, and no no one says anything to Homicide either. So the rules are inconsistently applied in this yeah. promotion. Th- that's another sign where Ring of Honor harps so much on like how they take rules seriously, but they they are just as inconsistent as anybody else. Where when it's a match they want it to happen in, they don't bring it up, they don't care about it. The referee, like in this match, Allison Dangers like can walk, crawl right into the ring or pull a wrestler out of the ring, like she does on one of the biggest near falls of the match, where everyone thinks Paul Lennon's won, and she pulls Xavier out of the ring right in front of the ref. Gabe tries to cover, like oh the ref couldn't see it, but like. She does other interference, too. So anyway, we get into late in the match. Very, very deep in the match. And Lurie and uh, Danger have a cat fight in the ring as Paul London and Xavier basically take a rest and watch from outside the ring. And then after the cat fight's done, they come back in and they finish up the match. But it, it was so just not needed and stupid. And it, it, it also was one of those classic Gabe things where we've talked about this before. On one hand, he goes like, Allison, I mean, Alexis Lurie loves Ring of Arm because it's where she can show off her athletic side. And then minutes later, they're having a cat fight, and Gabe's going, those are the prettiest, pu-, or it might be Doug at this time, I'm not sure, one of them's going, those are the prettiest punches I've ever seen, or something like that. And it's just like, they can't make up their mind whether Ring of Honor is this great place for serious women's wrestling, or whether Ring of Honor is like cat fights like ECW, and, oh, I could watch these hot women fight for hours. Oh, it's like. ECW cat fights where the women are dressed like human beings, unlike in ECW, <laughs> because it's definitely not the place for serious women athletes. They have not, that has not been a thing at all in, in ROH into, up till 2003, so... I think we have our answer for that one. Like, Gabe saying, you know, she loves it because she can show off her athletic side here. Like, really, there's no other wrestling promotion that lets her do a moonsault? Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure, like, that's all you've let her do in terms of, like, athletic stuff. Yeah, it's it's, but, it's pathetic. Yeah, I thought this was... I said about the final battle London-Xavier match, that was, I thought, a good match that gets very good if you had watched the entire Xavier title reign just to see how special that one felt in comparison, I feel like this is a very good match that turns great if you've seen all Ring of Honor before because it just does feel special. It feels almost like a big WWE match between the outside interference and the idea that the result for once is more important than the work and the crowd investment. And I really do think that Paul Hunnett should have won here. I feel like even knowing everything we know now, 
I feel like knowing what we knew, only knew what we knew then, he should have pulled the trigger. Paul London should have won. Yeah, and, Joe, Joe could have beaten London. You know, even a couple months later, even. And when you when you hear the crowd, they pop huge for the near falls. When when if you, for anyone who watches this, go back when you when um, Xavier wins for like half a second immediately after he wins. There's like a groan. Like an like an audible aww from people, some people in the crowd that I've rarely ever heard in wrestling, and I don't think that's a good sound. Like it's it's a sound I would have made when I was seven if my mom told me we weren't going out for frozen yogurt after shopping or something. Like just like oh, like like it's just the most whiny. Like like it's not even like boo. It's like oh, and then they kind of start booing, but uh, just pure disappointment for like just a brief half second of people's first reaction wasn't like god damn it it was like fuck like really we're not gonna get paul london winning like you're not gonna give us that at two ring of honor even you do (laughs) things like this that's what they're saying and little (laughs) did they know what they do to end the show yeah because um we're coming up for the main let's i just let me double check no other segments we're all clear for and I know people like uh, I know Rob Viper and other people and even you on the on the show have been talking for a long time like let's wait until we get to this match mm-hmm. we the scramble match the biggest scramble in Ring of Honor history the main event of the biggest show up to this point in Ring of Honor history for the biggest the biggest show the Hit Squad Divine Storm Mikey Whiprick and the SAT scored to the ring by Trinity defeated. Special K of Angel Dust, Brian XL, Deranged, Dixie, Hydro, Izzy, Jody Fleisch, Slim J, Slugger, and Yayo via pinfall in 33 minutes, 37 seconds after Moff, De- Mafia killed Deranged with a second rope burning hammer. Um, before I give it to you, Matt, let me just n- note a couple notes from Mike Johnson, who was plugged in and connected. He wrote on the scramble. This match was easily out of place on the card as it was all over the place. Those involved are well aware that they had the ball and dropped it. And Mike Johnson also notes, and I didn't notice this during the match. He says, Jody Fleisch was out on his feet for part of the match after a hard hit. I didn't notice that in the match. And uh, Dave, oh, I'll talk about what Dave said later. But Matt, this match, if the, if the riot is famous, this is more infamous among certain people. What did you think revisiting this match? Yeah, okay, so before I hesitantly get into this match, um, you since you mentioned it, right after the um, the intermission, Gabe on commentary refers to, he's like, oh, it's ever since the riot, you know, the infamous riot, which is hilarious that he called it an infamous riot, theoretically, <laughs> 20 minutes after it happened. Um, uh, yeah, I noticed that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, to this match. Um, so you mentioned all the Special K guys. Uh, I think officially the ones that were in the match and not in the corner were Deranged, Izzy, Dixie, Angel Dust, Jody, Fleisch, um, Slim J. I mean, not Dixie, actually. I think Brian XL, and then Dixie jumped in later. Um, but basically all of them were involved, like you said. Um, I will tell you this, and I'm going to make this uh, very honest uh, announcement right here. I really didn't take notes for this match. I was like, okay, fuck this. I'm going okay. to watch this match. I will let it wash over me. Um, so the first thing I notice is that the commentators do everything they can to not talk about the match. Um, Gabe just like talks about every single possible thing. He talks about all the partners, <laughs> promotions that have helped with ROH. He talks about all the wrestlers that have been in ROH throughout the year. talks about all the different commentators. They throw shade at Eric Gargiulo at one point. Then he yep. spends about 35 and a half hours talking about all the upcoming shows <laughs> all the way through like May. Um, talks about FWA and like all the different matches. And I mean, like by the time, and then by the time they're done with all that, it's basically in the home stretch. Every once in a while, they take a break to be like, oh, this match is terrible. And <laughs> it's far more entertaining than the match itself. Um, so you have. Um, so you have Mikey Whipwreck on the Babyface team, and he's like kind of doing a Tajiri shtick, right? Like he has like like he's like his head down, and like he's like he's kind of like doing that character. He has like stuff over his head, like he's and then he's he has a little like one off with Slim J, has some a few back and forths with the uh, with the Special K guys. Then about twelve minutes into the match, all the Special K guys do dives out of the ring, 
Um, and Mikey Whipwreck's left alone. Then all the baby faces come in, and then Mikey Whipwreck just starts hitting stunners on all of them. And Doug is like, what is Mikey Whipwreck doing? And Gabe was like, I don't know, but he should have done it three minutes into the match. I don't know what he waited so long for. <laughs> like, they're just, like, shitting on the match so bad. And it's not like there's no cool moves happening. It's just that there's really no rhyme or reason to them. You're not really sure, like, why something is happening. A lot of times in the match, as the commentators point out, like, nothing is happening. And Gabe is like, there's 40 guys out there, and they're just standing around. <laughs> this happens at least three times. That, he, that not only does that happen, but Gabe actually says it. Um, the crowd is into it at the beginning. They don't know what they're about to get, but it just keeps going. Um, there's a bunch of shots where they all do dodge. There's like two different spots where everybody lines up and does baseball slides into a guy. Um, but there's so many guys in the ring that nobody even knows who's what. Um, so that happens twice. There's a lot of stuff on commentary about where um, they talk, they joke about how Brian XL has been gone from the company since the summer, and he's all jacked now. He must have gotten jacked in, quote, Puerto Rico, because he said he was in Puerto Rico. But they basically intimate that he was in jail during this time. I don't know this was the case, but the announcers definitely do make that, uh, make that assertion that Brian XL was in jail. But to be fair, this is Brian XL's second Ring of Honor main event, because he did have that main event at <laughs> Night of Appreciation against Eddie Guerrero. So Mikey Whipwreck goes, turns heel, then he disappears. Um, then you have the uh, – so this is the unequivocal violence against women spot where um, I guess Trinity comes in. She goes after Mikey um, and then Mikey's like kind of going to go after her but Slugger pulls him aside. Trinity slaps Slugger and Slugger gives her the body bag. So that is officially 14-4-14 on man on woman violence. Um, gosh, what else? <laughs> Uh, Quiet Storm does hit his Canadian Destroyer at one point on Slim J. Uh, a lot of Slim J in this match. Um, you know, it's it's funny with Special K because there are just guys that are just like they're there every like once in a while, and then they're in Special K. Brian XL, I guess, was like the founding member, and yeah. now he's finally back. Uh, Jody Fleisch has been there once before, so now he's back. Derange is still very entertaining. You know, he's still doing all of his like he 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 does like he gets like put on like dropped on his head and then he sits up and does like a motion like he's like smoking pot then he <laughs> falls back down um and like they're like and doug is like what is what is deranged doing and gabe's like i don't know but he better roll out of the ring and i was like oh that's funny uh another funny part in the uh in the like rundown of the announcers talking about everyone who was in roh you know they're like oh sonny siaki looked good prince nana he was there uh <laughs> might as well have prince nana um so that's funny. I, I totally forgot that they stopped booking Nana. When was the last time he was there? Was it September? Was I'm not it, sure. It, it, I, I thought it was weird that they kind of shit on him too. Like, yeah. yeah, like you said, like the guys that get it the worst are Eric Gar- Gargiulo. They talk about like the announcers and they're praising everyone. And they shit on Eric Gargiulo. They're like, oh, that other guy or whatever. And it's funny, like going back to a Torch talk I was reading. I think it's the same one I've gotten that other stuff from. Jason Powell is like, whatever happened to... Like, oh, here, this is what happened. They're doing the torch talk, and Gabe talks about how he sent a copy of Era of Honor Begins to Paul Heyman, his mentor. And Jason Powell's like, well, what did he say? And he said his big note for me was he said, that guy doing play by play is the worst commentator I've ever heard. Get rid of him. And and Gabe's like, he's gone now. And uh, Jason Powell falls out with, like, oh, I thought he was actually doing really good. I thought he and Credo were, like, doing it really different and really good. And then kind of Gabe kind of backtracks. It's like, well, he had he had to choose between us and CZW, and he had to go back to CZW. Jason, so Powell, is, Jason Powell is wrong. He is? He, oh, oh, about the quality of their commentary. Yes, yes definitely. He is wrong. <laughs> but it, it's funny, like, they really, like, it, it's weird, like, He's the one guy this early on that they really have a grudge with, Eric Gargiulo, for some reason. That was a very acrimonious, like, split. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, who the hell knows? And the Brian XL thing I thought was weird, too. Like, was it that he – were they suggesting that he was in jail or were they suggesting that just, like, he told them he couldn't work for them anymore because he was going to Puerto Rico and then maybe – I think he might have worked some other indies in New York during that time. I'm not sure. I will tell you exactly what they said. Um, so a couple times they talk about he was in Puerto Rico. Then they say, Brian Excel was jacked. He must have worked out a lot in Puerto Rico. And then Gabe is like, yeah, it's almost like he was in lockdown in the gym in Puerto Rico getting so jacked. So, I mean, if you interpret that differently, uh, you know, then you can explain that to me. But 
this is, this is how I interpret this. So this match, like, well, yeah. So I have a couple more things to say. Oh yeah, go yeah, go back. I'm sorry. Go no, back. it's okay. Tower of Doom with everybody, and they make and they they talk about the. Uh, um, think about how like the ring held up, which actually it is impressive that the ring held up. But man, someone could have gotten hurt because everyone fell on top of everyone there. Then they get into the head dropping portion where they just do a bunch of head do- dropping moves, and the crowd boos every single time someone kicks out. Doesn't matter which uh, which team it is, they just want the match to end. Um, Slim J gets chucked onto everybody in the crowd by Monster Mac in probably the most enjoyable spot of the show, I would say. Um, they do the Spanish Fly on Izzy, Special K break it up. Then they do the second row burning hammer, and uh, on deranged gets the three during the match. Oh, another cool spot: um, Monster Mac does a muscle. Bu- I mean, Ma- Mafia does a muscle buster on Slim J. Slim J takes a lot of punishment really well, actually. I have to say, um, the muscle buster that Monster Mac gives, I mean, that Mafia gives, is pretty impressive. Um, like way, looking way more brutal than any of the ones Samoa Joe ever gave. And maybe the third, I forget who the third one was, but I know there was two wrestlers in Ring of Honor before Mafia that did the uh, muscle buster before Joe. So we've had three wrestlers now do it. Um, Jay Briscoe did it, someone else did it, and Mafia. I feel like it and might have been like a like a quiet storm or something. It might have been. And I'll note again, Samoa Joe, I'm calling you out. You said in a shoot interview you invented the muscle buster when you watched an anime and saw an anime character do it. And then you thought, hey, I could do that in wrestling. Joe, come on. I've seen it now. Three different wrestlers do it in Ring of Honor before you ever did it. They all watched the same anime. <laughs> Ring of Honor and the secret anime ring. <laughs> I can just imagine D- Jay Briscoe and Dan Moth enjoying some Dragon Ball Z. It wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> anyway, what's your take on this wonderful, wonderful match? See, this was that was what I said after the match without really taking notes. So just imagine how much shit was in this match. Well, all right. So as as a match, I think the biggest problem with this match is like the Scramble Madness match has been my favorite scramble we've re- watched up to this point. And I thought that was great because it went bigger and more over the top. There was more guys, more like crazy multi-man spots. It went longer. It, I just felt like it was excessive in a good way. And this is like to turning that and doing it even bigger and it just exploding in a bad way. And it's funny, like there were some definite sloppy moments in this match, but for a well over half an hour, like a 33 minute um, scramble match. It didn't fall apart in some of the ways I was expecting on rewatch. It wasn't as bad as it could have been, but I think the biggest sin it commits is it just isn't, it's just, it's not even like it's a train wreck. It's boring in some ways. It's, it, there's so much of what they do just feels like the greatest hits of what they've done before, but sometimes it doesn't even feel like greatest hits. Sometimes it feels like this match is like four, a greatest hits album with four hits and then like 15 B sides from other scramble matches. It's just a lot of mid-level scramble spots done for a long, long, long time. And the one highlight to me was deranged. I feel like deranged is one of the most unheralded, guys of early ring of honor he's so good in these scrambles he has possibly, so much pers- possibly one of the most underrated wrestlers of all time if the, I mean, considering how much we're talking him up yeah i mean he, he, there's a moment in this match and god help me i thought this was he made it work where he takes off his shirt and tries to like pose down buff against like monster mac and then he uh, tickles Monster Mac, and Monster Mac sells it by laughing. <laughs> and then later, Monster Mac grabs him by the nipples and pulls him around. And God help me, this was funny to me. Like, Derange can make this stuff work. He also takes the biggest bumps in this match, by and large. Like Him and Slim J. Yeah, the both of them. I mean... He takes the second rope burning hammer for the finish. He takes some other big spots too. Whatever he was getting paid for these matches wasn't enough because he was so carrying the personality and taking the biggest bumps. Like just no one is close to him as a biggest standout in so many of these scrambles. But again, it's biggest sin isn't wasn't like, oh guys, if you watch this match, you're gonna see a botch a minute. It's like, no, you're gonna see a crowd that desperately wants the night to end watching a bunch of like mid-level SAT spots and shit like that. And, but the other end of this match is what Matt mentioned before, which is 
I have rarely heard commentators shit on a match as it was happening, or I guess this was post-produced, but you know what I mean, like this. Um, when when What Matt said is no exaggeration at all. I would say at least the first half of a half an hour plus match is Gabe and Doug doing everything they can to not talk about the match. Gabe very early on says something like, who booked this? Um, as, as Matt pointed out, anytime something bad happens, Gabe points it out like he's like, when they're the one thing I liked was Matt, you pointed out that, um, like when, when there was nothing, there was a pause in the action, Gabe would get mad. There was also like a couple times when there'd be a near fall and no one would break it up. And Gabe would be like, there's like 20 people in this match. How come no one's breaking it up? And then I really noticed watching this match that like almost no falls in this match get broken up by other people. And there's a hundred people around the ring. Like it's all, like no one gives a shit. It's just everyone taking turns doing spots. It, it it's it's crazy again. Like you said, the crowd's actually getting mad that the match isn't ending. And when it does end, there's a pop. But it's like a pop of like, yay, you you ended it. We can go home now. And I think if Gabe and Doug had like um, old tax returns or something, they would have started reading those, like anything to not talk about this match. They go through every single thing they could. It's basically like watching this match is like listening to people um, read every thank you card they've written in a couple years during a match. Like just, we'd like to thank this. We'd like to thank that. Oh, remember who came to the ring of honor then? Oh yeah, that was cool. And just, yeah, they're talking about like the boogie nights at one point. It's like, come on people. Yeah. And, and then again, like, Matt says they run down every single card they have booked coming up. Like, yeah, the, the most noteworthy thing that I remember from l- watching this match is them mentioning in 2003 that ECWA had been around for 35 years, wh- is, which tells me that now it has been around for 50 years, which I guess other people probably knew, but I didn't realize. And so they have a show coming up, um, or they just had a show yesterday, actually, in Atlantic City that in featured Tito Santana and Tony Atlas. So they really have been around for 50 years. <laughs> Everyone involved has been around for 50 years. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, in a way this was kind of a letdown because it was not the train wreck I thought it would be. Instead, it was just kind of a really shitty mistake that everyone knew was a mistake. I mean, going to back to what Mike Johnson said, he said the people in this match knew they had dropped the ball. Um, the, the other thing I want to note is everyone in this match on the face side, the SAT side came out with face paint, including Mikey Wivrek, which was, I guess a decision, <laughs> a choice made. Um, the Mikey Wivrek thing was so bizarre where like Gabe points out in the commentary, apparently like, he he wrestles as a face for quite a significant time. He gets to really dominate a fair bit. And then he decides, like, midway through the match to turn on his team and then leave and never come back for the rest of the match. Like, such weird booking. I'll note that Dave wrote at the time, he says, the big deal about this match is that Mikey Ripwreck is coming out of retirement. And then he writes in back brackets, he's actually already worked some other indie shows in the area. <laughs> so I like that he's like, the big deal is Mikey Ripwreck's out of retirement. Well, he's already been out of retirement. So, but, so in other words, there is no big deal in this match. <laughs> no big deal at all. There's not even a small deal. And yeah, this is not good. Just I, I I can see Gabe's rationale for booking this last only in the sense of I know listening to shoot interviews from guys like Danielson and Samoa Joe, they frequently through the years, no pun intended, like talked about I hate following those scramble matches. Like I think Joe or something has said, like, why don't I just go out with a gun and shoot my opponent now? Where they would say, like, that's the only way I'm gonna be able to follow that. It's not fair. So I could see Gabe going, well, if I put the scramble at the end, no one has to follow it. But really, there was no way they were going to fall. Even if this was a well-done scramble, it did not feel like the fitting end to this show. And No, the star power didn't feel big enough. And there wasn't a – I know they tried to make it like a, with a couple segments on other shows like, oh, it's a feud. Everyone hates Special K for being Special K. But it didn't feel like some big blow-off grudge match that deserved the main event. No, no one seemed angry. Yeah. Man, maybe if Red was there, it would have added some star power. I don't know. Probably wouldn't have made any difference at all. But he was not on this show. 
Yes, uh, Gabe points out during the thing that Red is still on his first tour of Zero of uh, All Japan, so he could not make it. And so that's the end of the matches, but we have a few notable segments to end the show. Christopher Daniels is cutting another backstage promo with Alice in Danger. Uh, Daniels cuts a very, what I thought was a very good promo here. He takes off the collar and the accoutrements of the uh, Fallen Angel character, and he says this promo isn't coming from the Fallen Angel. It's coming from Christopher Daniels to Steve Carino. He says that they, he goes by their real history, which is that they he thought he and Fre- Steve became friends for life when they were in the WWF dojo together. He runs down a bunch of Carino's accomplishments and talks about how he was always so happy that no one was happier when all these good things happened for Steve than he was. Like he was always rooting for him. And then he's able doing this promo, doing something I think is pretty amazing, which is like, he frames Carino going after his titles, I think, successfully as, like, the acts of a jealous friend who's kind of stabbing him in the back, which wasn't how I was going to see it before. Like, before, it's just like, yeah, Steve's kind of a jerk, but he's going after titles. That's his right. But he basically frames it as, like, every time you've had a good thing in wrestling, I've been so happy for you. And now I have this one good thing, and I've had a hard career, and you're coming after my stuff? Like, why do you have to do that? And... I actually kind of like sympathized with Christopher Daniels in this promo, which I think was probably the point because the rumor at the time was that this feud was supposed to be the thing that turned Christopher Daniels baby face. Yeah. They didn't fully go all the way with Daniels being a baby face, but he did feel like, like he was turning here. Yeah. Th- this, this is a, this is a very natural baby face promo. Like it doesn't feel like he's just turning on a dime, but he makes a case and you go like, yeah, I can see you. I can see why you feel this way. Yeah, I agree. The one thing that watching this though, it makes me feel a little bit bad of what a bad job ROH did with the prophecy in general. Um, I think the biggest problem with it was um, making Donovan Morgan, the other guy, because he's there so infrequently and he like really doesn't add much to the table. Yeah, I mean, I mean, especially with, I mean, and this is helps give, I mean, Daniel's feel for this promo. But the idea of Carino starts his stable by taking simply Luscious and Samoa Joe, and that's another thing Daniel's uses. Like, why'd you have to do that? Why, you know, it, it, it just emphasized in my mind like. Daniels really has nothing at this point. Like he has Alice in Danger, who's a good like second, and he has Xavier because, like you said, booking Donovan Morgan, who can hardly ever be around, he, he really barely has a stable. It's Xavier and him. Yeah, so they, they they make some changes pretty soon, but it's really a while before the prophecy really becomes something that feels like anything. Yeah, even even the Mark Briscoe thing. He joined for one show. He never showed up again till this match. They never bring it up again, except Gabe offhandedly saying like, "Well, Mark's not interested in being in the prophecy anymore." So, yeah, yeah, they a re- failure of a, of a staple, even though they won all the titles. Yeah, G- Gabe really could have done better by uh, the prophecy here. Um, next, we get a quick little promo where AJ finds Paul London backstage. He asks Paul to become a tag team with him. London realizes that they could get revenge on Xavier that way and agrees. Um, London wouldn't end up being able to make the next show. I think he gets hurt, so Red would take the spot. So it looks like in Gabe's booking, the idea was, all right, I'm not going to give Paul, Paul London the title. But he's going to get his revenge on Xavier, and we'll give him the tag titles with AJ. And so it's kind of an interesting idea because AJ and Paul London both lost matches to Xavier. So, like, how do you get their steam back and give them something? And having them be a a tag team might actually have been an an interesting idea. Yeah, it probably would have been pretty good. You know, who knows? Um, Yeah. I will say this before we get to the next segment. So the, during the whole show, they're building up that this special guy is coming in at the next ROH show, and there's going to be a video, and they're saving the big surprise for the end. And then, well, uh, yeah. See, all right, yeah. As Matt said, they bring up a few times, like Doug and them are like, you know, there's going to be a big guy coming on the next show, but starting, but and we can't tell you, isn't you know, we're you have to wait to the end of the show with the promo. And so our next segment is a CM Punk promo where he tells us he's requested promo time. And he starts putting over, he does another one of these promos where his delivery is fine, but it's obviously the character doesn't fit Punk. He's just trying to be the good, wholesome baby face where he's 
putting over the talent, even C.W. Anderson, for competing against him. He gets to Colt Cabana, who barges in once he mentions his name and acts so annoying and like, hey, Punk, how you doing? Thanks for letting me sleep on your hotel floor tonight. And Punk gets pissed. They do a take two of the promo where Punk does the entire first part of the promo the same again. I guess to show us like so realistic. It's a peek behind the curtain. But anyway, Punk keeps going with his promo and he just gives away that Raven's coming to Ring of Honor. Like, so this whole surprise, I, I, like Matt was getting to, the whole surprise is, is that Raven's going to be here in this promo that Raven does. And instead, it's just, Punk just says in his promo, like, oh, Raven's coming to Ring of Honor. Like, 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 like everyone knows this. And Punk challenges him to a match. And he calmly, he's not angry at this point, but he lays out that he's straight edge, he's drug free, he has a tattooed on his fingers, and that Raven's drug field pass bothers him. And, you know, it's still a babyface promo, but it's laying the groundwork for the feud to come. At that point, uh, Colt Cabana comes back after the promo's done and is like, hey, Punk, great promo, blah, blah, blah. And Punk is like, I hope you like sleeping in the car. And then Colt sucks up to him and eventually lets him sleep on his, Punk lets him sleep on his hotel floor again. So, yeah, I mean. And then we get the Raven promo, but it's he's cutting a promo in response to Punk. So all the timeline of this makes no sense about when any of this stuff was recorded. Yeah, next we get a Raven promo, and I think it's another very good promo where um, Raven says – Raven feels like he's basically gotten to a point in his career where he's looked at old guys and now people are looking at him like the old guy. And but I'm not that up. old, and, and I looked it up yeah. and he was 30, 37 or 38 at this point. Which isn't that old. It's not I that mean, old, no. And uh, Punk said, you know, he says Punk isn't going to make his, his name off uh, Raven's back. Um, Raven gets this kind of funny thing where he talks about, like, um, he says he's in the best shape of his life and can wrestle harder and run longer. That, and he says that, he, I, that did not seem to be true. <laughs> <laughs> he says he wonders if the alcohol preserved him, like, like additives, he says. Um, he wonders if Punk is drug free because he's afraid to take a walk on the dark side. And then at this point, it's been a very good promo. Raven then starts to get up his own ass a little bit. He says, quote, they say I am bathed in divine poetic madness, which, um, Raven, (laughs) no one has said that about anybody ever until you just said that. (laughs) No one says that Raven. Um, and then you know, he my dad, said, my dad used to say it about Raven. He used to, <laughs> used to come into my room at night and say, you know, that Raven bathed in divine poetic madness. He, you and, know, I, he, and, I, and then, and then they, then that's when they took my dad away. <laughs> he was like, Matt, like, who's that guy in that hardcore wrestling thing you used to watch? Oh, not the salmon. You know, the guy, you know, long hair, he wore the, the shirts, you know, like he, he's that guy that's bathed in divine poetic madness. You know, that guy. Like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's such a good impression. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of experience talking to your dad about you. Uh-huh. Get lots of notes. You know, I do my research, mm-hmm. but anyway, Raven ends the promo saying that, um, he welcomes punk to his clockwork orange house of fun. And then the camera kind of does something that WWE would learn later, which is to stay on Raven just a couple seconds too long after the promo is done. That's uh, so it's funny. Like again, going back to at this point, you wouldn't think a punk of what he would become. He gets sandwiched between Daniels and Raven and they do much better promos than him, at least on this night. Like I, I think Daniels and Raven both did very good promos. Punk's promo, just a promo. But again, as Matt was talking about before, that would soon change. Yeah, I really think that a lot of that was on purpose. I really yeah. do. We'll, we'll, we'll see how I feel about that one. I mean, I'm really interested in revisiting this stuff, like this feud that's about to kick off on the next show. And then we finally get the last um, segment on the DVD. And I think I might have said this about one show before. I have to change my mind. This is definitely the best end to a Ring of Honor show ever. We cut to what looks to be backstage, like an after party. Paul London, Brian Danielson, Dan Moth, and Loki are eating the Ring of Honor cake that was at the start of the show. They're just biting and, the cake. You just see their heads and they're biting the cake. Yeah, and yeah. Hands and involved at all. Danielson has th- – this is the picture I'm going to use for um, the, the, the podcast. I'm going to include this in the notes for Matt to send of – 
them just with their faces in the keg, just mouths first. And Danielson has this wide eyed, intense, insane look with his face buried in the cake. It is just insane. Even low keys getting in on this cake. Um, Rob Feinstein walks in and he thanks the boys for making Ring of Honor what it is, all this stuff. And then, like, he asks them how the cake is. And they tell Rob to try it by pushing it in his face and covering his face in frosting and cake. Everyone laughs. Ha ha ha. You could put, like, the credits up at this point and be like, you know, Ring of Honor was filmed before a live studio audience. Like, it's very much a sitcom moment. And then, in the end, the light, most lighthearted moment you will ever see Low Key do. This is how the show ends. Low Key turns to the camera, a couple dabs of frosting on his face, and says, Betcha, that's a pretty damn good cake, though. <laughs> and it's the most, it, it's like Charming. the opposite of Low Key otherwise. Like, him actually, it's one of the only times I've ever seen him kind of let his guard down and have fun. Yeah. And. That's the weirdest and best ending to a Ring of Honor show in history. When you eat cake, <laughs> you are you are enjoying sweet treats. When you eat cake, you are celebrating an anniversary. When Four you have, layers. Yes, you you get you get my point. <laughs> um, so that runs that ends the show and. Man, that, there that, there was a whole lot of show there. So it sure was. I think it, we did a pretty good job getting through that in a reasonable amount of time. For the first time ever, our podcast was significantly shorter than the show that we were reviewing, and I think yeah. that is quite an accomplishment. So I I think it is, and there was a, we need a fair bit. Ca- we need some about. cake. I am going to go back to those leftover Chinese food that probably gave me food poisoning because I have to know, Matt. I just have to know. That is a bad idea. I'm (laughs) telling you not to do that. (laughs) Um, So what did you think of the show as a whole? Like, I think this was a very good show. It, I I feel like you could have edited this show down a bit, probably. And it it is the, the scramble. I mean, it does leave kind of a weird taste in the mouth, but I thought the Paul London stuff, I, I feel like Paul London, like I get mad watching him now. I wrote this on Twitter. I feel like there's been no bigger squandering of talent in our generation than Paul London. I, I think if he was around today, he could have written his ticket at least before the 205 live era where guys like that now get put in that thing. But he could have – he would have been one of the hottest guys on the indies today. He could have gone to anywhere he wanted. I just – he was so great and he was the most over guy on this show, which is – pretty amazing considering he entered the company less than a year earlier as a relative complete unknown to those fans and i thought that alone those two matches make the show great but then you got the danielson and joe was a good match um the opener was fine the riot is very memorable if not maybe amazing in hindsight it's at least a novelty that's worth watching once not the three times they showed it but the the briscoes match was very good um uh, I really liked it. I thought this was possibly the best ROH show up until that this point. Um, I thought it was great. Um, it really was a good encapsulation of like every aspect of ROH, the good and the bad. But it, I think it had like as far as sheer number of really good matches, it probably had the most of uh, of any ROH show. Maybe it didn't have the like quite top level, although that three way was pretty close to the top tier. I would say, even though even if it didn't quite get there. Um, like you said, London just seemed like the superstar of superstars. The one thing the show didn't have, which I actually thought helped it, was it didn't have the gratuitous, like, bloody brawl. Yeah. Um, and I actually think that's a good thing. And the scramble was a bad version of the scramble, but it still had the cool spot fest with the three-way, so you didn't really need it. Um, but I thought, you know, yes, the ending was bad, but, you know, the thing about the, it being the last match is you could just turn the DVD off before that. You know, mm-hmm. so I uh, I th- I think this was this was a this was a really good show, really good. I mean, they they do better from there, but I think this was a culmination of like everything that has been going into making ROH better over the course of the year. I thought the crowd was good despite some douchey moments. I thought the atmosphere was good. They had a lot of big stuff happen on the show. Um, I thought it was a great show. It was a great DVD. Like this is an unequivocal like this is the DVD that you should watch if you're an ROH fan. Yes, you, you should go back and watch this. I mean, there there's some things, if you listen to this, you probably know what to fast forward through. But I also think there's just, I mean, there's a lot of forward momentum coming out of the show where they've planted a lot of seats like Punk, Raven, and uh, the, group. The, Dan- 
yeah, th- that feud's not going to turn out to be much, but at this point, you didn't know that. Yeah. And even, like, the hyping of the Bristles are going to be a tag division, and we got AJ and London teaming up. I mean, they're really, you know, putting... It's it's a big show, but it's coming out of it with a bunch of things to look forward to. Yeah, and if and if, it's, if, if you watch that main event, you sure had a lot of the very specific things that you knew were going to be on upcoming shows, because that's what they talked about for much and <laughs> much of it. So, um. <laughs> So... If anyone wants to contact us, as always, you can contact us at Trevor Dame on Trevor on Twitter, not Trevor, uh, or at Mayor MGF on Twitter. You can uh, I, oh now I'm forgetting how the contact is. No, so, through the years at gmail dot com. T H R O H. We want some more through. action. We want some more action on that email address. Yeah, get yeah, some really emails. People, yeah, people haven't emailed us. Yeah, we got a few at first, and you guys have been slacking. Or um, we post on – I check the thread on the Pro Wrestling Only board, Figure 4 board, Voices of Wrestling Message board. ROHworld.com. Um, yes, and next time on the show, we will be covering Expect the Unexpected. Them returning to the Boston area, we'll have AJ Styles and Amazing Red taking on Xavier and Christopher Daniels for the Ring of Honor tag titles. We'll also have Raven and CM Punk for the first time ever. And we may have something involved with the show where you might have to expect the unexpected when it comes to the show. I don't want to promise anything just yet, but we might have something unexpected happening on the show. And anything else? The show might be like a poetry bathed in an angel's tears or whatever Raven said. It's going to be a poetry slam. Okay. The whole thing's going to be like a long haiku. Yes. That, that's, that would be a really long haiku, <laughs> if you know the rules of a haiku. Yes. All right. But yeah, no, this was, this was good. I, uh, I'm, you know, I'm glad that we're back in the saddle. Uh, this was a really good show to watch. It was four hours, but it was fun to watch the whole time. So uh, I'm looking forward to... Uh, now, going through a stretch of shows now, which I have not really seen in years... Uh, expect the unexpected, a night of champions, uh, epic encounter, round robin challenge two is actually a show that I've never seen. So I'm mm. really looking forward to this next string of shows. I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, and the next three shows are going to be pretty noteworthy. Where next show we have Raven Punk and a title change. Show after that is the Samoa Joe, you know, reign starts, and then the show after that is a pretty famous London Danielson match. So three kind of really meaty kind of shows to talk about where there'll be big noteworthy things to talk about yes so no more revenge on uh, on the prophecy like low-key shows for a while yes definitely not so stay tuned stay tuned and thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you soon or hear you soon or you'll hear us soon or dear god give me that chinese food no